What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary analysis, and funny stuff. I'm Andrea Ever, and I join by Miss Christine Steimer. Hello. And Miss Brittany Brombacher is also here. Hello. Hi, ladies. The Steinbachers are here. The yeah. Steinbachers. That's our new. That, that actually stuck. I didn't think it would stick, but it we did. The Steinbacher lives. We had to figure out how to add the Brene in there. Stein Brene Bacher. Stein. Ooh, that actually didn't sound half bad. Steinmene Bacher? That sounds like a disease. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I does. have the Stein Rene Bacher. It's incurable. <laughs> oh, no. Well, it is incurable. For, well, Stay with us forever. I'm going to like nip that curable, incurable disease talk in the bud. Um, Thank you so much for joining us, everybody who is listening and watching. Of course, you can find us at youtube.com slash what's good games or on your favorite podcast app. If you haven't yet subscribed on your favorite podcast app, we would greatly appreciate you just clicking that little button. It helps us out a lot. And if you feel so inclined, maybe you want to drop us a review. That would help us out too. Over on the iTunes store, we saw some people trolling us a little bit in our reviews and that made us sad <laughs> i think that would be actually a really fun feature to read the stupid one-star reviews that we get from time to time on the show because they're just silly it's just like stupid stuff like oh they're, they're they're three girls why aren't there any men on the show you know like stuff like that it's like God, we get, get men on the show we've had plenty of amazing male men's. guests on this show um, we're going to have tons more this year. Um, it's one of my goals is to get more guests on the show. But, you know, we've been working out some kinks with the new studio setup that I'm working on. And, of course, you know, we have some Patreon changes coming next month. So I've been focusing on that instead of scheduling stuff. But we have a long list of amazing people that we would love to get on the show. So, of course, if you guys ever have somebody that you're like, oh, my gosh, it would be so great if you got this person on the show, please email us at contact at what's good games dot com and we will do our best to reach out to them and see if you know they want to come chat with us about some video games but until then we have some news to get to and this week it is brought to you by our december turbo patrons oh, that's yeah. right we realized oops we forgot to read our december turbo patron names and we feel really bad about that and we want to make sure that anybody who was in the december december turbo patron december. category knows that if they feel that they didn't get their pledges worth or if they're upset about that, we are happy to refund you your money for the month of December. We are going to be reading all of the names uh, this week, which are from January and December. That's a lot of names, you guys. It's going to be a lot of overlap names. But uh, we also just want to let you guys know that we understand that saying it was the holidays and we were busy isn't an excuse you guys come first for us and you're our priority and we feel deeply sad and regretful that we overlooked this and we want you to know that we want to make it right if you feel bad about this or if you feel slighted or you feel like you didn't get your money's worth so if that is you don't be afraid to please just reach out to us through patreon and we will help you out and get you taken care of so with that out of the way um do we have the names in it's down below down below Go, scroll down okay. scrolling down. through the show notes um yes. so if you're watching the video this week you may notice that this is the first time that i'm sitting at the new desk inside the what's good game studio i was like hey the other girls sit at their desk when we're not all recording together i want to sit at my desk i like it because it zoomed in on your pretty face Hey, yeah, thanks. I can see you better. I, I know. Well, the, that camera. So what for people who always listen to the show and never watch it, I used to have to send a second camera to the video conferencing software that we use. So that way, uh, Britt and Steimer can actually see me when we're recording the show every week. Otherwise, they would just hear my voice. And that's makes for not great conversation <laughs> when you're trying to, you know, like laugh and have a good good time with people. So I was using a Nikon D7000, which is a really great DSLR camera that is designed to take still photographs. You can use it to make some really high-end video, but it doesn't have a lens that zooms on it because the lens I was using was picked out specifically for when I was hosting Gamer Next Door Weekly on Playboy's Gamer Next Door, their Playboy gaming channel. 
a long time ago and I also used it for GT News back at Game Trailers. And we were just using it as a secondary camera with some software and I was really far away because I could not zoom in with that lens. But now I'm using a webcam like a real girl. <laughs> You're a real girl. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Okay, ladies, I totally just rigged this. But now I have the December Turbo Patrons at the very bottom of this document. And it's in weird formatting because I do not have Microsoft Excel on this computer. Oh, shit. Wait, oh. is it really that different? Also, my door just opened on its own and I hope it's my dog. I also hope it's your dog and not a ghost. Uh, not a ghost. Um, <laughs> I don't know um, where the overlap is, honestly, in the names. I see it. You see it? What do you mean? I mean, like... Oh, I the mean, odds I think we'll of us just reading have... our amazing Turbo patrons' names twice is really high because a lot of our Turbo patrons are the same month to month. Thank you so yeah. much for the ongoing support. It means a lot to us. Heart emoji. It was my dog, and now he's sniffing around my room. I don't <laughs> want to yell at him on the show, but I'm about to yell at him on the show. Just pull your microphone away from your face, maybe, before you yell. I will if it comes down to that. <laughs> But is he being a bad boy? What's happening? No, no, he's being a good boy, but he's trying to eat something on the floor, and I'm not sure what he's trying to eat. I think it's a piece of equipment or a cord, but I can't Go see. Go get it, Brett. Don't let him eat the equipment. I'm making sure he's not. I'm eyeing him. Okay, <laughs> Got your eyes on the prize. Oh, right here. Okay, we're good. You little bastard. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> All right, so are hey. we doing these one, two, three? Yeah, or- sure. Yeah. Let's just roll and then okay. we'll just do the other January names later on the show. And if you're you're read twice, you're read twice because you're amazing. OK, you're such professional. I'll start. Here we go. Uh, Lincoln Davis. David Icolucci. Alex Rogopoulos. Ferris Atay. Male Bittner. Justin Foshi. I don't have my glasses. I have to zoom in. <laughs> Martha Emery. Lincoln Thurber. Andrew Susan. Kathy Andrew Susan. Lucas. Calf Dog. Kia B. Alberto Andres Videla. Steph Wu. Regan. Regan oh. Imsen. <laughs> Bill Stillwell. <laughs> Dustin Lewis. Tara Bruno. Zach Hershey Kiss. <laughs> Timu Nikanen. Nikanen. Oh my gosh, Timu, I'm sorry. I fucked up your name. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic Wellner. Sion Stevenson. Professor Metal Gear. Aaron Saxton. Michael Shanholtz. Timothy Bennett. RJ Bryan. Trevor. Oh, sorry, Brittany. <laughs> no, we got this. We got this. Trevor Starkey. This is hard. We uh, know how to juggle. <laughs> Melanthius Owens. Jason Demers. <laughs> Joe Schlieff. Cool Rat Daddy. El Moshell. Jared Howard. Tyler McCall. Carl Peterson. Carl. <laughs> Carl. Carl. Like Coral. Carl. Coral. Coral. <laughs> Joseph Don't Bosset. know why I said it like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Muhammad Muhammad. <laughs> Momo, what's up? Namely. Wait, did you miss? You Mom. missed Giselle. No, no, I said Giselle. Brittany said it. Oh, you did. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, Nambui. Wait, there should be more. There should be a lot more. Where are the rest of them? <laughs> Where are the what rest happened? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. <laughs> You're so seeing how the more. sausage is made. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What, what happened? Is- While Brittany pulls the rest of the names, I would like to take this moment to say, if you're listening... And you would like us to read your name on the show. You can go to patreon.com slash what's good games. Why would you want to? <laughs> because <laughs> shout outs are fun. And every month part of us is like, is it too long? Do people not like it? Do people appreciate it? And we always have such a good time because we love seeing the same names pop up over and over again. The amount of people who have been supporting us since the very beginning on Patreon is so incredible and words truly can't describe how grateful we are for all of you believing in us and supporting what we do and believing in our mission and um, wanting to support our voices out there in this video game space and we know that there's lots of other people that you could be supporting with your dollars and that everybody has budgets and you only have limited dollars to spend on podcasts and entertainment and we are really grateful that you spend it with us boom hold on that's all I wanted to say um, you didn't I really don't. Oh, now it's all colorful. I don't see the. I don't see them. I'm I don't see no stars. Let me. Oh yeah, just refresh. There we go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just refresh the page. There they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's your turn, Andrea. We left off. No, it's not. I. It's Brittany's I think turn. It's me. Yeah. Chris Wilson. 
Thomas Jennings. Anthony Rodriguez. Jason Davis. Gregory Horton. E. Izari. Noel Neverez. Lucas Cheney. Rob Leonard. Mark Drastrup. Sorry. Oh, John Drake. Oh, I know that guy. <laughs> John Kennison. Emily Kent. Trent Pennington. Ooh, that's a fancy Ariella name. Ariella Furman. Will Hernandez. Stephanie DuPont. Kevin Dunkel. Billy Shibley. Stephanie Fitzwilliam. Sam. Jesse Spencer. Geek Heart Games. Tommy Larson. Punk Defied. Ross Haney. Simon Bergstead. Nicole Humphrey. Brooke Larie, Asia Harris. Anthony Brooke, Murphy. Jasmine Lee. Elizabeth Brooke. Adrienne Williams. Ryan B. Pure Blue Octopus. <laughs> Andrew Cotton. <laughs> Pete Shoemaker. <laughs> Brian Harper. Jason Kerr. Sydney Carr. Gio Corsi. Roland Bala. Paige Porter. Eric Guerrero. Patrick Weller. Jay McCurr. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Godere. <laughs> Ozzy Mieja. Mahia. Christine Rodriguez. Ripped Gamers, which is, Lewis. by the way, a good thing to remember in the month of January. Ripped Gamers. Uh, indeed. Facebook group. Check it out. Lewis Creech. Patrick Landry. E. Benjamin Checkness. Dale Sun. Donatio Shinichio Rathan. <laughs> oh, my mama, <laughs> Teresa Enert. And Ivan... Bejarino. Bejarano? You got all your family members, Andrea. Look at that. I know, right? You sure did. They're sweet. Thank you so much again to all of our December, October patrons. We love you guys. And apologies one more time about missing your names and your shout outs in the month of December. All right. On to some news. Uh, the first story is really kind of impressive but not surprising at the same time sony interactive entertainment has announced the playstation 4 is in global domination so they sent out a press perfect air horn um they sent out a press release earlier this week also the note in the show notes is hilarious it says, Sony Shell, how much are they paying you? Ha ha. How much money? Give me some of that to WGG, JK. I love it. Is my camera still working, ladies? <laughs> no, you froze. Oh, you're totally frozen. I didn't notice. <laughs> oh, God, this show's a hot garbage truck on fire. Okay. Um, I don't know you what happened. You can just turn the camera on and turn it back off. Or like, click the disable your video and then click enable your video and see if it fixes it. Ooh. Let's see. Oh. You're are, you're making not a bad face. That's for Oh, really? Because so usually I make good. weird faces. All right, hold on. No, it's like a semi-normal face. Bye. <laughs> Wait, where are you going? She She's left. so far she away. She's like, I'm done. I'm done with this. She just, so she just about, rage quit. She, fixed she was so upset that PlayStation 4 is doing so well that she wanted to leave. She was like, leave. I'm done with this show. It's over. Yes, um, it's well, over. Hopefully she'll get that fixed. But while she's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and read these numbers yes. and we can discuss Please as soon do. as she's back. So PlayStation 4 has now cumulatively sold through more than 91.6 million units globally as of December 31st, 2018. Within the above number, PS4 has sold through more than 5.6 million units globally during the 2018 holiday season alone. Moreover, more than 50.7 million PS4 Yes, you're back. Yeah, you're PS4 back. More <laughs> games were sold through globally during the 2018 holiday season, which sums up to 876 million PS4 games cumulatively sold through worldwide as of December 31st, 2018. And Marvel Spider-Man, launched in September, has cumulatively sold more than 9 million copies worldwide as of November 2018. John Cadera, the president and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, said, thanks to the continued support from our fans during the holiday season, we are pleased to announce the PS4 has reached 91.6 million units globally. We are also happy to announce that the monthly active users of the PlayStation Network continues to grow or continues to show strong growth and has surpassed 90 million as of the end of November. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to our passionate community around the globe and our partners for helping us achieve these milestones. This year, we will bring more enhanced experiences to our fans along with a highly anticipated lineup of games that are only possible on PS4. As we look toward the next PS4 milestone, SIE will continue to evolve and we will further expand the platform to deliver the best interactive entertainment experiences to the world. Hot diggity damn. Yeah. That is a Indeed. very impressive number. Many congratulations. 
I wonder how miffed they were that it didn't quite round up to 92 million. <laughs> Can we fudge the numbers a little bit? Oh. It's so close. So close. So if you want to, I pulled some numbers of the top console sales of all time. Starting with PS2 at 155 million, Nintendo mm-hmm. DS at 154 million, if you want to count that. Game Boy, Game Boy Color, 118 million. PlayStation at 102 million. Wii at 101 million. And then you have PlayStation 4 at 91.6 million, followed by Xbox 360 at 84 million. So I think that PS4 has the opportunity to overtake the Wii's numbers and definitely crack 100 million by the time it's all said and done. I don't think that's unreasonable at all. I made a friendly wager with Tim Geddes over on Kind of Funny Games Daily for a whole pizza. If in five years he believes the PS4 will overtake the PS2's numbers. And I said, you're out of your goddamn mind. Yeah. (laughs) There's no way the PS4 is going to sell over 155. Actually, I believe the most current numbers are 158 million um, Mm. for the PS2. It's just a different era. And a lot of people bought their PS2s as entertainment devices only, as a DVD player. Yeah, I can't. I can't see PS4 selling another almost 60, 60 plus million units, especially at this point in the console Mm -hmm. generation. And I mean, looking forward to games like the coming out this year in particular and going forward, I don't know. I mean, we do have some, obviously, Tilo, Days Gone, Death Stranding, whatever the fuck that's going to do. Who knows? Uh, But I just can't see that many more games coming out to push that many more units. The only thing, I do not think it's, 60 million units worth but a thing to consider is different parts of the world like they tend to purchase consoles after the new ones come out so like ps4 will still have some sales oh yeah uh once whatever ps blah blah five whatever they're gonna call it especially countries like brazil like things are so expensive in that country that they tend to like not be able to purchase things until they are considered old sure so Again, I don't think it's 60 million units worth, but <laughs> there'll still be some movement there a little bit, I would imagine. Still, though, that's true. impressive. It is. It's definitely impressive, especially when you think about how Microsoft has not released their numbers in quite some time and has said that they're not planning to ever because it's more about engagement than raw hardware sales for them. And then we all know that it's kind of like a bullshit answer. That's a we don't want to talk about it please stop asking (laughs) yeah exactly and not to say that they haven't been successful this generation i think the way that console wars used to be important aren't as important anymore with how diversified the gaming landscape is from a hardware perspective and microsoft is clearly setting themselves up to have a much more successful generation with whatever's coming next for them than the xbox one and I like my Xbox One. I love playing games on my Xbox One X on my 4K TV. It makes games super beautiful. But they have suffered from a lack of first-party exclusives where Sony has absolutely crushed it. When you think about what we were talking about last week and some of our top games of 2018, there were a lot of PlayStation-exclusive games in the top 10 and in the top 5 for all three of us. And I think that says something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it also had to do with like something changed with third parties in them. Like, because I remember my 360, I played most of third party games I associated with the 360 and I used my PlayStation only to play PlayStation exclusives. I didn't use it for anything else. But then this, you know, this, this console generation, I find myself mostly using my Xbox as a media device and I'll play the occasional exclusive that we get briefly and then leave it alone. And like the only third party game I've really played on that is Assassin's Creed Odyssey right now. So I just think that that's also, they also, I think kind of let their third party partnerships lax a little more than they should have. And that was a really important piece of that puzzle. Agreed. Well, congratulations, Sony. You crushed it. You did it. Next up in the news. The Division 2 won't be on Steam, but oh, will shit. be on the Epic Game Store. Oh, snap. Snap. 
IGN writes, Ubisoft and Epic have announced a partnership to release Tom Clancy's PC version of The Division 2 on the newly launched Epic Game Store, according to GamesIndustry.biz. The game will also be available through Ubisoft, but will not be released on Steam. Additionally, it has been announced that Ubisoft and Epic will release additional select titles over the next year, and that any pre-orders of The Division 2 from other online stores would not be be affected by the recent decision. Due to, due to the Epic Game Store taking only 12% of game sales compared to Steam's 30% cut, there have been talks of the platform being a real threat to Steam. Quote, we aim to provide the most publisher-friendly store, said Tim Sweeney, founder and CEO of Epic, providing direct access to customers and an 88% revenue split, enabling game creators to further reinvest in building great games. Vice President of Partnerships at Ubisoft, Chris Early, added, we entrust Epic to deliver a smooth journey for our fans, from pre-ordering the game and enjoying our beta to the launch, Epic continues to disrupt the video game industry and their third-party digital distribution model is the largest, excuse me, the latest example of something Ubisoft wants to support. So this oh, is man. kind of a big deal. I think Epic really needed a giant third-party publisher like Ubisoft in their corner to really make the Epic Game Store a viable thing. And I say that because... I assumed people would flock to the Epic Game Store, but then we reached out to you guys, to our community, people who play PC games, and a shocking amount of you said, I'm not planning on leaving Steam to go to the Epic Game Store. So now I say, would something like this change your mind? What if a company like Bethesda, who has been a mainstay on Steam, decided, you know what, we're also going to go to the Epic Game Store because that split is just too big to ignore. I think it's curious because like this is a sort of a power move in the sense like like hey we're going to partner with them and it's because your cut sucks but I wonder if say we've got they've got Ubisoft in their corner now say other people start to join them because they're feeling bold then Steam's like all right we'll drop it and now now Epic Store is dead in the water like no one like you no longer have the incentive that you once did because every the average user is going to continue to use Steam. The average user is not going to Epic Game Store. I think, yeah, the average user is not going to want to abandon their library. And by abandon, I mean they're going to, they want everything in one spot. However, yes. if they do decide to go over to Epic Game Store for whatever exclusive games, I still don't think that they're going to want to continue to purchase their games on Epic Game Store unless there's an incredible incentive. And I don't think a lot of people are going to know why they should unless every time someone makes a purchase, that there's me a little pop up. Because, well, did you know that now these developers get 88% of the shares, unlike other 30% from the other guys? And I don't think most people care. No, and it's, that's what I'm saying is I don't yeah. think people care enough. I It makes me sad, but I think the majority of people who play games don't understand about, they don't understand the relationship, the revenue sharing. They don't get it. And therefore, what are they going to stick to? They're going to stick to the thing they've had for how many years now? I still think it's exciting and it's good for Epic Games and it's great for the developers. And uh, but yeah, I don't I don't see this being a Steam killer, which people are saying is it going to be a Steam killer? It's like I I don't think so. No, no, no. it's I'm, too. Yeah. Like, this is a big deal for people like in the industry. It's much more of like a niche audience that really, again, cares about the rev split, all that kind of shit. But like, you pull someone on the street who uses Steam, they're gonna be like. How much money do you think the developers made? They're going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. And <laughs> I just pay Steam and they give me a thing. Like what? It's a yeah. thing. So last year I pulled a number. Steam released 7,672 games. And I wonder, you know, obviously if you're a developer, you, you have incentive to go to Epic Game Store because of the split is favorable. However, if you don't have a following or a community around your game you're probably going to want to go to steam where there is that install base sure the market is super saturated but i feel like you would want to tap into that rather than go to epic game store i mean i don't know I you may or may not it depends on how engaged the epic game store audience becomes and it might be a situation where it's like switch right like where because there's not a whole lot of competition people right at the moment obviously Jeez. um people are able to find things a little bit more easily there why are you making this I'm face? I'm making that. No, no, I'm making this face because I just <laughs> recently went on the Switch eShop and I was just 
kind of hit in the face with a lot of uh, shovel. I, shovel. I hate using that word. Sorry. That's such mm. an old, old school word. Do you remember about seven months ago when it was really good? <laughs> it was. No, I, there's all these <laughs> stupid games on here. And I'm like, this is starting to look like the freaking Wii. And it's driving me crazy. So when isn't you said that, that I got a little the mad. concern that we had? I know this is a tangent, but I kind of don't care. But do you remember when we reported <laughs> on that story? When yes. Nintendo announced that they were going to be adding so many more games to the eShop, and we're all like, like 20 a week we're or all something. like, please we're like, no. But maybe don't. <laughs> yeah. Because it used yeah. to be that way. Yeah. Where you hop in the eShop and it's like, okay, you know oh, what? Oh, you I'm, found something I'm, cool. Yeah. Like maybe a few new games, but I hop in there and it's like puzzles and drawing and family this. And I'm like, no, it's okay. Yeah. Anyway, and tangent. Yeah. But anyways, if it was, ba- if it's similar to like back in that day, it might be an interesting thing where. Uh, you'll see higher sales there because people are either more easily able to find it, maybe the rating system is better, people are more inclined to use it, whatever. X Y Z. So, do you think Steam will lower their or lower? Not modify? yet. No. I do think eventually they might. Yeah. It depends on how many people they get. Uh, backed. You know, you basically have to back them into a corner. Um, and I don't know how many more publishers it will take for them to feel that way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean they might feel uh, they're definitely probably feeling a little pressure now like ooh, we just kind of look like the bad guy i don't know how much they care because they're still kind of rolling around in money but yeah so in 2017 more numbers um they made an uh, estimated 4.3 billion and half of that came from top 100 titles so you know yeah so at some point if 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 enough of those top 100 groups are just like Fuck you. It's like <laughs> we're, not, we're not publishing on you anymore. Enjoy PUBG's like, your bye. indie garbage. Sorry, that sounded really mean. But you know what I mean. Yeah. I don't. Not all indie games are garbage. Don't come at me. <laughs> that's what I'm that's saying. it. The pitchforks <laughs> are out. The torches are lit. No. That's not what I meant. You know but, what I mean. Yeah. Um, but like the, the crazy part is that even though Steam has a bigger footprint, and we've talked about the reason why people aren't moving off of Steam is because it's not just about the games, it's about all of the features that are built into the Steam client. It still is cheaper for Indie to publish somewhere else than it is on Steam because the revenue split is better. And it's tough to say if they're going to be losing out by having a smaller footprint on the Epic Game Store than on Steam. It's like, well, it doesn't necessarily... How, like, how, how, I would love to see some data because the question I have is... Yes. Let's say that there's 100 million users on Steam and that there's 10 million users on Epic Game Store. But if you're only getting, you know, 1% of what's on Steam versus like maybe 10 to 20% what's on Epic Game Store, I'm not really good at math, so hopefully my math is sound. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Impromptu where's, math, where's not Sean a strong Drake when I need him? He's very good at doing math out loud. Um, like... In my mind, I'm thinking I would love to see the data as to like what makes it better because there's we as somebody who runs a YouTube channel and a podcast look at engagement numbers and overall impressions and look at the data of our traffic all the time. And what we have found is that we get much higher engagement than channels that maybe get bigger raw numbers than we do or channels that have millions of subscribers where we have like tens of thousands, but we get more engagement than they do. And so I would be curious as somebody who kind of likes to look at the data crunch as to does an indie developer truly have a better shot at making money on Steam being put into that giant pool versus yep. being put on the Epic Game Store? Don't know. Couldn't we say. We don't know yet. Time but a good first, this is a great step for Epic Game Store. Really, really good. Yeah, it's a great job. partnership. We'll have to see how it goes. Uh, next up, Fox has said that Alien Blackout is not a sequel to Isolation, despite sharing a main character. So this is via Game Informer. So before I go into the story, just a little bit of background. You guys may have heard the rumors about Alien Blackout. There was a bunch of leaks, people thinking it was going to be another uh, mainstay PC and console installment, a sequel to Alien Isolation since we haven't really heard much from the Alien franchise and now we have been alerted that it is indeed a mobile game and people on the internet seem to be very upset about that. (laughs) They have some feelings about about mobile games. Uh, So Fox has announced that a new Alien game starring Alien Isolation's main character 
Amanda Ripley was on the way. It's called Alien Blackout, and while some fans of the terrifying stealth-driven game might be enthused by this news, they may also want to take a seat for the next bit. The game is for mobile devices exclusively, and Fox says it is not a sequel to Isolation. Alien Blackout has you guiding Amanda Ripley and her crew through seven fear-inducing levels in a setup that sounds familiar to Five Nights at Freddy's. You'll be managing a space station, jumping from cameras, and dealing with damage controls to try and defeat the beast. The game promises multiple conclusions based on your choices a few hours after revealing blackout the official alien account tweeted that there was more to come possibly as a response to fans backlash to blackout's announcement what hashtag replayed watch excuse me hashtag read play watch that's the hashtag the alien account was using means is anyone's guess at this point but that likely means that more games as well including hopefully a look at the alien shooter that cold iron studios is working on and they updated their story uh, to say that Fox reached out to Game Informer to clarify that Blackout is a standalone game that shares Amanda Ripley as a main character but is not related to or a sequel of Isolation. So. It, it makes me sad that mobile games just get shit on instantly for being a mobile game. Yep, it's, I agree. You know, I get it. You know, with the whole Diablo thing in this, like you want a console game, all the technology, blah, 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 too big TV, blah, blah, whatever. But still, like that doesn't mean this is going to be a bad game. In fact, you might thoroughly enjoy this. And maybe instead of shitting on it, just think like, hey, this is an opportunity for me to play this game. And I'm sure there's something else coming down the road. But for now, this is what I got. And be happy with what you have. LOL. Yeah, I'm right. with you, Britt. I think that people's gut reaction or immediate you know kind of spewing of vitriol on the internet is always hateful towards mobile games it's just so tired you know it's like we're approaching the year 2020 which in and of itself oh my god don't say that no we still have all of 2019 I know but I mean like I'm talking about like in my lifetime I remember being a kid and just thinking about the year 2020 as like a incredibly distant thing of like oh we're never gonna get there it's never gonna happen and now we're (laughs) we're almost here and like we can play games on these powerful little mini computers that fit into our pocket and I think that's incredible and there's a ton of amazing mobile games out there and it really upsets me that there are so many people that won't give them a chance and then instantly shit on them. Now, I'm not saying that you're not allowed to want more, that you're not allowed to say, hey, I loved Alien Isolation and I was really hoping for another installment like Isolation and that this clearly isn't that game. It doesn't mean that that game isn't coming or isn't in the works because it was really widely received pretty positively. But it just means that they're working on this first. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. It's like and it's a everything. different team. Exactly. Like, it's not like the same people. This isn't taking anything away from you, I guess. Right. Like Sega isn't making this game. No. <laughs> you know? Like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm willing to reserve judgment until I get a chance to see it and play it. I think that it could work really well and could potentially be interesting. Like some of the art that, you know, we saw, they put out a little trailer that came with it when they made the announcement, which kind of happened accidentally. Um, And now that it's out there, I'm I'm like, this looks fine. This looks totally fine. I think people are going to find a reason to hate it, you know. And I'm so excited to see the numbers, especially for Diablo and this as well, because obviously it's just been backlash, backlash, backlash. And I'm hoping that's just, that's the vocal minority, right? Like, uh, of course, in doing what we do, we see the vocal minority a lot. Thankfully, not on our What's Good channels because we have an amazing community, but we see it in other places. And I hope these games come out and crush it and then maybe it can quell some of the the pitchforks and torches. But yeah, we And I know that there have been bad alien games in the past. Trust me, we all remember Alien Colonial Marines and the controversy surrounding that game. Oh, I forgot about that. But but I <laughs> I want to believe and I want to live in the wor- in a world and I kind of have to live in a world where I can believe something's going to be good and not believe something's going to be bad. I would rather set myself up to be a little bit disappointed than go in with this negative Nancy attitude being like it's definitely going to suck. It's mobile, it's trash. It's like, you know what? Like it's, I'm too tired to be that angry all the time. I just can't. It does take a lot of energy. Right? And that's As someone who is angry center. quite frequently, yeah. it, it takes a lot of energy. <laughs> so that's why I just don't think about mobile games in general, because it's just not really my cup of tea for the most part. 
Exactly. And, and thank you for making that point. If you don't want to play it, don't play it. You don't have to bitch about it. It's really not it. hard to not play it. And it's not hard to not talk about it. Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head. It's not taken away from anything. I mean, unless they came out and said, no, all future alien games will be on mobile. And then it... Because we think this is the future of the world. Although I will say, the latest Breath of Fire was on mobile. And that pissed me off because that was a really, really bad cash grab. Anyway. Those exist. They do. It's possible that this is one. But we don't know yet. Don't know. Yeah. All right, next up. Oh, wait, I have a question here from Brandon KG, Brandon. since he knows we can't pronounce his name, so he's now Dan. putting his initials. <laughs> he wrote into Dear WGG, and he said, Hello, what's good? I hope this finds you well. Recently, a new mobile game from the Aliens franchise was announced, and it got me thinking about the Command & Conquer Rivals announcement and the Diablo debacle from BlizzCon. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts were on major properties getting into the mobile space? I know these aren't the only examples, but do you think this will be more common? Thanks, as always, for taking my question. If you do, Happy New Year and have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, so we answered this a little bit, um, but I think that we're only going to see more and more franchises getting into the mobile space. I think about even a game like Assassin's Creed that we were just talking about in the last story, how they have several mobile titles that have been successful and how it feels like every major AAA game needs a mobile counterpart because they know that people can't bring their consoles with them wherever they go or their PC with them unless you have like a really baller gaming PC, which I know some of you do. Or um, you're Andrea and you decide to take your console with you on vacations. Hey, you know what? I enjoy playing <laughs> video games while I'm relaxing, okay? <laughs> I didn't bring it to Italy when I went though, so. That's I, good. I did, I did bring my Switch though. Um, <clears throat> but yes, I think the short answer to your question is, is Will there be, will it be more common? Yes, absolutely. I think it's only going to, mobile's only going to further spread. It's not going away. It's not going to get smaller. So if you hate mobile games, you better strap in. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to speak about Command and Conquer Rivals because I know that also got a lot of shit. Um, Jason has been playing that every night for at least, I would say, one to two hours for weeks now since it came out. And he loves it. I think in total he spent maybe $10 on it but it's according to him it's great he's really really having a great time with it and he plays it every single night and he really gets into it he loves the strategy aspect of it and the matchmaking according to him is really great too so yeah if that's something you heard a lot of crap about i would say maybe give it a shot it's free it's free (laughs) free Free i hate free there you it is. Would, That's our girl. Steimer, you would. <laughs> All right. Our last story of this week. Brit's favorite. Do you want to read it, Brit? No, I just want to make weird faces all okay. the time. Resident Evil 2 Remake is getting a demo and it's coming out today on January 11th and it lasts just 30 minutes. That's so what she this- said. <laughs> exactly. Right. Actually, this is kind of like a, a long decent time. time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm tired even thinking about it. Um, <laughs> Bird. So this write-up comes from Polygon. Capcom will give survival horror fans a brief taste of the Resident Evil 2 remake later this week. That means today. With a limited time demo. Very limited, in fact, at just 30 minutes. Resident Evil 2's one-shot demo will be available for PS4, PC, and Xbox One from Mission Objective. They can continue to replay the demo until the 30-minute mark is reached. The demo will also include a new cinematic trailer that's exclusive to the trial version of Resident Evil 2. While the demo itself is time limited, the trailer included as part of that experience can be rewatched multiple times without limitations. Resident Evil 2's one-shot demo will feature Leon Kennedy as a playable character. The full game will also include Claire Redfield, Ada Wong, and other playable characters as featured in the original game. Resident Evil 2, of course, is coming to PS4, Windows PC, and Xbox One on January 25th. So they have said, if you die, you can keep playing um but and if you finish it you can go back and start it over again but once that 30 minute timer is up it's up and i believe once it starts it doesn't stop so don't like load it up and play for 10 minutes and then walk away (laughs) i am so tired from all that dancing oh my god i'm out of shape oh so i played this demo and i think andrea you played this demo i have yes so 
when I played this, ladies and gentlemen, this was after I did the E3 stream with Capcom, which was about 45 minutes. So when I did this 30 minute demo, I just kind of wandered around. So you start off in the Raccoon City PD lobby in Marvin's there, and you can chat with him if you want to. But what I did and what made me happy was just walking around exploring and looking at all the little details, maybe trying to solve like one or two puzzles, but just take it in. Just know if you're gonna play this game anyway, there's no point in I think trying to finish the demo. The, the trailer will be leaked on YouTube or posted to YouTube within a matter of hours, probably. Because if you finish it, you get the trailer. Um, so, yeah, just kind of like, just take it all in. Bask in all of its glory. Enjoy. Oh, I love those eyebrow waggles that Simon has given me. <laughs> well, it's just because you were like, you should play this. I'm like, but why would I want to play this 30-minute demo if I'm just going to play the game? Maybe we'll make you play it on the happy hour Q&A stream. So oh, what I, yeah, what that I works. Mean, we'll do that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Or the um, after hour stream, I mean. So if you're going to play it, let me clarify. If you're going to play it, I would suggest, like I said, just wandering around, look at all the details, take it all in, and just get ready. Get your body ready for that January 25th moment. Uh, obviously, if you're not sure if you're going to play it or not, then sure, try to do the puzzles, but just take it all in. Look at Leon's hair physics. Look at his nice shoulders and his back as he walks. Ooh, look at Marvin's baby, beautifully you're speaking detailed my language. face and his bloody bite wound. And check out all the typewriters and the shotguns and all the, oh, the statues. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. I'm Bert, I think <laughs> you might be alone in going into the appreciation of the level of detail and all of the animation but the toilet demo. paper in the hallways andrew has so much oh, detail I, I loved how much you <laughs> talked about the toilet paper in the holiday three like you were so excited about it and i was like it's fucking toilet paper oh. what are you talking about it literally no, i have somebody's bungle and you're like no they needed toilet paper and i'm like sure this people is need toilet paper i guess i don't quite know. honestly the most hype i'll get for a game in a very 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 long time i am not thinking clearly Granted, when the game comes out, I will be objective and I will critique it as need as you know need be. Will but for you now, though? I'm just will you yes. though? No, I have I have a list of things that I'm. You saw you were there for my. She's she's been on. She's been critical of it already. Yeah, I got my things, but I'm just so much of a fan that I just fucking can't wait. Let's go. Let's, oh, let's yeah. go. I feel you. Until Pokemon gets announced, and then you'll lose your shit oh, all over again. Oh my god! You know what? I'll lose my shit with you if it's good. That'll be the next thing. Either that or if they had, it was Nintendo announces the next Zelda, obviously not for a very long time, and it's like realistic looking and aiming for that T, that teen rating, like Twilight <laughs> Princess. That will get me going, too. I thought you said T, like they like want some shade. I was like, what? Oh, no. <laughs> Give me that teen. Give me some what? blood. Give me some drama. Give me some dark clouds. Oh, my God. All right. Stop well, me. I believe you have until January 31st to play the demo i mean the game yes. obviously comes out on the, the 25th comes out, but, but if you're not sure if you want to buy the game yeah it helps so check it out have some fun shoot some zombies it'll be great <laughs> zombies um all right well that'll do it for our first segment and when we come back after the break we're going to talk about what we've been playing and it's going to be some things a little off the beaten path at least for britain high <laughs> so stick with us everybody we'll see you in a minute What's good, everybody, and welcome to the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast. Thanks for sticking with us. We love that you're here. And now it's time for us to talk about what we've been playing. And this week, it's brought to you by our Happy Hour Q&A. That's right. It's one of our favorite things to do with our patrons every month over at patreon.com slash what's good games. If you would like to ask us any question under the sun, you can do so in our Patreon exclusive live stream. It happens once a month. And this month, it's happening Saturday, January 12th at 12 p.m. Pacific time. We're doing it a little bit earlier in the day, so our friends across the pond over in Europe can hopefully join us. And if you're, you know, have Saturday night plans, we won't uh, impede on them here in the United States. At 2 p.m. is going to be the after hour stream. Yes, we have brought back a fan favorite stream where we play games for you and sometimes with you, and most of the time pretty badly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Our stream last month with Human Fall Flat was hilarious. Oh, my God. Um, and we appreciate everybody who stopped by and played with us. It was a good time. We will be posting in the Patreon page. Uh, we By this time, we will have already been posted the poll for which game you would like us to play. And because we're shooting this in advance, I don't know what, what won. So you'll have to 
come by and find out on Saturday. Um, but we hope to see you guys there and it'll be lots of fun. Again, if you missed the details, you can head to patreon.com slash what's good games or you can check out our Twitter account or our Facebook page. Of course, facebook.com slash what's good games and twitter.com slash what's good underscore games. All right. So now that that housekeeping is out of the way, Britt, I see that and you I have been playing what I mean, these are both kind of serious games. I guess I don't uh, know much about Y2K. That is not a serious game. That's actually probably one of the weirdest games I've ever played. Okay, because I also played a, a game super with weird the horse game. face man. That's true. So tell me all about Y2K, a postmodern RPG. Okay, so this is developed by Axe Studios, and it was announced. <laughs> you like that, my little accent? I did, I did. Anything for you, Steimer. Uh, 2015, <laughs> when it was announced, and I started paying attention to it because they dropped my trigger word, which is Earthbound, and it mm. the Earthbound influences. And this game, like I would say, like Persona is kind of quirky. Earthbound is quirky. This game is just weird, but not in a bad way. So you start off and you are, I think, 22. You're this, he calls himself a ginger, so I'm not being rude, but he's a redheaded guy named Alex. And the joke that he has with all his friends is he's a ginger, blah, blah, blah. And you come home and you're, it takes place in 1999. You have this red hair, like this epic red, like beard and then a flannel shirt and then you just look totally 90s and you come home from college and you are at your parents house and you're going to run groceries or get groceries for your mom and along the way you run into a cat who steals your grocery list leads you into an abandoned warehouse in some weird twilight village and inside this warehouse is a bunch of puzzles and a girl who's apparently lived there her whole life and she's some weird like I don't even know yet because I'm not that far into the game. But the good thing about this, me talking about this now, is I'm not quite at the part where it's embargoed. So I can talk about all that I've experienced so far. So anyway, you meet this girl and you're like, dude, what are you doing in here? You're sitting on a tree and there's like space all around you. And she's like, I don't know. I've just lived here my whole life. And you're like, dude, let's get an elevator. And she's like, what's an elevator? Whatever. So you take her down in an elevator. Wait, why would you take her to an elevator? (laughs) That's weird. To leave, to leave, to leave <laughs> hey, this area. Hey, girl. Hey, baby girl. Why don't you get in this elevator with me? <laughs> and it turns out that the cat is her cat. You find the cat. You go down the elevator. And meanwhile, going down the elevator, she's abducted by these star men. She starts crying like pink liquid. And then all of her bones are visible. And then she's gone. Okay. Like, legit. This is, it's weird. And then you meet up with your friend. And... You guys are trying to figure out what happened to her because there's this website and it's kind of like, um, oh, I don't know. Is there a conspiracy theorist website out there where they like probably like a Reddit subreddit or something? And her these pictures of her getting abducted by these starmen appear on the Internet. And then now you and your friend are trying to find her and you just met another girl who could do things with her mind. I don't know. It's fucking weird. It's just weird on so many levels. Not only is the story weird, but the art is kind of trippy like there are spirals sometimes in the levels there's like random eyes that open and close the music is so strange there's everything about this game is weird but i love it but what do you do so do you fight people (laughs) yes so it is an rpg so think about so i think this is where some of the earthbound influences come in it's um top down you know you're in it's 1999 you're in a a city and it's all realistic in that sense. You know, you have like your dial-up uh, internet. You have your CRTs. Oh, hell yeah, dial-up <laughs> internet. <laughs> the guy has a Super Nintendo and a PlayStation in his bedroom. Uh, so, you know. Ooh, it, he it was rich. I know, right? Before that call. Well, his mo- actually, his mom is rich. She brought internet to this town. That's what oh, I okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so how the game plays is you are this 22-year-old and just looking at it face value, you know, it's a, a modern 1999 setting. You know, it's what you would expect from 1999. There are houses, there are stores to go in. You know, you can buy like burgers from a burger store and that replenishes your hit points. So anyway, from Earthbound perspective and influences, it's kind of you have these towns and you wander through the towns and you talk to people. There's arcades, there's sports stores. You buy equipment and level your stuff up. Um, if you fight... The fighting system is a little weird, too. And not in a bad way. I say weird, but it's, it's a good thing. Uh, so the, the way the guy it's fights. Unique. Yeah, unique. The way the way Alex fights is he throws a CD that you have equipped. And in but this is it case, turn-based or is it? It's turn-based. Yeah, so okay. it's turn-based RPG stuff style. And his weapon is a CD called He Wants It That Way by the Back Alley Boys. 
Nice. I like this. I like this. Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, 1999 references, especially around that time. And it's all a mini game. So a turntable starts spinning and there's yellow and red marks on the record player. And as it spins, you have to push A and make sure you hit A when it's over the yellow spots. And then the more you hit, the more. Like DJ Hero. Yeah. Yeah. The the more you hit, the higher your combo is. I never played DJ Hero, but I'll agree with you. Um, so, yeah, that's how, that's how he fights. And another guy uses a camera and you have to push the button prompts when you when it goes over the little mark thing. It's kind of hard to explain. But for some reason, I am just so into this game. I can't put it down. And it's so strange. And I wouldn't even say it's like Earthbound because it's really not. But I think I'm, if you haven't played Earthbound, you won't notice anything. And if you have and you're a diehard fan, you'd be like, oh, yeah, like the some of the background music, some of the elements of how you play you have hit points and pp power points or psychic points excuse me so yeah anyway this game comes out january 17th on ps4 switch and vita and steam oh vita vita i found my yeah. vita randomly i've decided i'm gonna give it away at pax east it's probably a good idea a good home give it to it. somebody give it a good home yeah but yeah so i would say if you like turn-based rpgs and something that's a little quirky wonky and weird and it's a fun little, you know, because it takes place in 1999. So it's a fun throwback. The writing is really clever. The voice acting is really good. And it's, uh, I, I'm into it. I'm feeling it. I've only maybe put like five hours into it. But so far, it's a good time. Cool. Yeah. It's so weird. the weird game that I have been playing is called Everything. So this is from David O'Reilly, and it's being published by Double Fine for Nintendo Switch. And it releases on Switch, I believe, where is the release date? Um, I don't, I have to look it up what the actual release date is. But this game has been out um, for quite some time on PC and other consoles. So it's just like, it's just, we're talking about it now because it's, it's coming to Switch. And they so graciously gave me a code to try this out because I I didn't hear anything about this game. I had no idea what this game was. Um, But I saw that Double Fine was publishing it. And I'm like, oh, I like what Double Fine publishes. Maybe I'll check it out. And boy, oh boy, was I not prepared for how weird this game is. Um, (laughs) Have either of you heard of this game or played this game? I've heard of it and I just tried Googling it and I can't find it because when I type everything on Switch, I get not. Yeah, <laughs> you get not yeah, this game. Yeah, you have to do everything game. So let me read a little snippet here from uh, Julie Muncy's article on Wired back in 2017 when um, she played it on PlayStation 4. Um, Everything is the brainchild of David O'Reilly, an artist and digital creator who's probably best known for designing the video game interfaces used in Spike Jones's Her. In the video game world, though, he's celebrated as the creator of Mountain, a beguiling and confounding title about the life of a single mountain suspended in space. It lived on your computer, life grew in it, it talked to you. Eventually, it would leave. Mountain was a polarizing work, the sort of thing that provokes critical debate about what a video game actually is. At its heart, though, Mountain was an eccentric playful meditation on existence from a narrow field of view a sort of ontological toy box everything takes that same sensibility and projects it to the heavens so you begin the game at a determined procedurally generated point a specific object in a specific place at a specific time of day so in her review she was a moose on an ice continent in my playthrough i was a palomino horse in a forest Ooh. okay <laughs> Yes, and you do. You <laughs> sing in the game. So you press down on the right stick of the Joy-Con to sing in the game. I'm using air quotes there because depending on what you are will depend what the sound is. Because you can be literally everything in this game from a tuft of grass to a whole tree to a single like microorganism on the back of a monkey to zooming out to being a whole planet. It's really difficult to describe what this game is. So I started. But like, what do you do as the thing? So great question. So I started as this pony, right? And I go to move through the space. And instead of like walking like a horse does, imagine the pony is like a toy pony. So all the legs are fixed like a like a My Little Pony toy where the legs don't bend or anything. It's just yep. solid. It just 
Yeah. And when it moves, it just rotates a quarter, like 90 degrees at a time. So it's like a, like a square rolling. So it's like, like side, 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 side. And like, so I'm literally doing like somersaults as I try to move forward. And I, the first thing I do is like, this is weird. Why am I not moving? Like, why is this not animated? Um, and John's watching me play and he's like, because it's expensive to animate everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like, he's not wrong. <laughs> like, okay. So literally every creature that has legs moves this way where you're just like we awkwardly somersaulting uh, and then you can find other animals like you in the world so i did find another pack of of palomino horses and then when you sing to them they'll sing back to you and you can group up with them and you can all like somersault together and i was like i feel like i'm just like not going anywhere and then you see these little icons like these little cloud icons and you go up to them and you you hit the a button and this little thought bubble comes up and it's like these thoughts about existence and philosophy and all kinds of like frankly really weird shit that I'm like why what what is this even like what is the point of this game and like I'm trying I'm trying to figure it out and then I get to I'm just so I'm walking I'm somersaulting through the world and I you can ascend and descend into bigger and smaller items. So I went down to like a couple blades of grass and then I went smaller to like, like a little duck. And then I went even smaller to this tiny little green frog. And the way the frog was moving was like, imagine it's just like a flat frog. It's just like shaking back and forth as it like goes through the world. It's like, like the I, South Park characters. C- uh, mm, mm, yes. Worse. Not as oh. smooth, <laughs> even like more awkward looking. <laughs> you know I know exactly what you mean. Yes, it's like that. It's like a super like oversimplified animation style. And let me tell you, when you're really small, you move real slow. Because <laughs> I was yeah. at a point in the game where I was kind of still in the tutorial mode. And it was like, oh, ascend into something big by getting close to it. And I was like, oh, I see a tree in the distance. Man, I was... <laughs> Slowly hopping to that tree for a really long time. 40 days, 40 nights. <laughs> but then you can't move as a tree and you can't move as a blade of grass. But you can. And you can move back and game. forth. So when you're a tree, you still move, but it's almost like you're teleporting forward a little bit. Huh. Um, which Magic is, trees. Yeah, which is really odd. But then when you sing to a group of trees, they kind of just put out this pulse. There's no actual audible sound. Um, but you can uh, group up with them. And then once you, you know, um, sing to them enough, uh, you can dance. With sing the... to be the song of my people. Yeah. So you can dance. So I got into a group of trees um, and danced. Uh, lilies. <laughs> I was a lily and I was dancing with a bunch of other lilies. And once you start dancing, you can um, birth a new lily. And basically it just means it, it's like poof. There's like a little magic cloud and a new one appears. And you can just keep going in a circle where you're just like dancing and there's new lilies and dancing and then you're birthing a new one. And so this whole thing, I'm like trying to figure out, like, what's the point of it all? (laughs) What am I doing? Well, what's the point of life, Andrea? I was like, do I need to be like super high to play this game (laughs) to understand what's happening? Um, And I got to another point where there was a new icon on the screen and I was like, oh, what's that? And it was an audio clip. So some of the little bubbles that you can go and look at feature audio snippets from the late philosopher Alan Watts, whose worldview was heavily influenced by Buddhism, but he was thought by many to be a maverick thinker as well as a really fantastic speaker. So his voice really reminds you of that like old timey radio voice. Um, And it's super soothing and, um, there are some really poignant things he says about like life, the universe and everything kind of makes me think about that line from the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. One of my favorite movies. Um, never actually read the book. Got to go back and do that, but it's, it's weird. So I kept, I decided, you know what, let me just keep ascending and see how high I can ascend. So I looked, looked up into the sky and I found you know, like a bird or whatever. And then I looked up again and then I became the continent that I was on. So like as a continent, you're kind of just like moving around the ocean. And then I looked up again and then I became the whole planet. And then once you're in the galaxy, man, if you thought moving as a frog through grass towards a tree took a long time, try moving as a planet through the 
wide open space of a freaking galaxy. Which doesn't it, make any sense because planets move very, very fast so they get through. Anyways, they fine. do, but the galaxy is... It's just is, the distance. The galaxy is so big. The, the scale is so much bigger. And there's no frame of reference in space. It's like no. at least at least on on Earth, I was like, oh, there's that tree over there, that tree over there, and that other tree over there, and I can look at the three trees and kind of get a, a spatial awareness. In space, in outer space, that doesn't exist because you're so far away from the other planets, it takes a really long time to get to them. But I did find one um, that looked like me. I found a ringed planet, and then I found another ringed planet, and we sang. Did to you each other. sing to cute. them? Yes, I did. <laughs> And then it took me a little bit to figure out. Um, I, I ended up becoming a different planet, an alien planet. And I was like, ooh, I wonder if I can descend into the alien planet. And you can. So I descended mm. down and then everything was different on the alien planet. Like the birds were actually like these spheres. And I'm like, but they, but they were flying around in the sky, but it just looked like little orbs flying around. I'm like, that's not a bird. It's an orb. But it was an alien planet. That's what they called a bird. And then we didn't go down onto the grass level. Like all of the creatures are different. Like I found this little like squid octopus thing that oh. had a weird name. And so it was like, it was a really fascinating thought experiment, if nothing else. And I've, I had to go do quite a bit of research on this game to be like, what the hell is this game? And why do people think it's so amazing? Am I missing it? And I, even now, like reading some of the reviews online, I just, I, I think something about the overall philosophy of this game is just lost on me because the graphical fidelity of it is so low that I'm having a hard time taking it seriously. Like, I think they were striving for the big kind of procedurally generated universe that No Man's Sky, I think, achieved, but they didn't get there. It's like a really rundown version of No Man's Sky, but without the fun, like, exploration battle collecting and overall like rpg mechanics there's really like none of that like it's really stripped down it's it's hmm, would it be a good I, game to give I, to your kids no Maybe? i think no. <laughs> no no i think a child would get bored <laughs> instantly because i think um. the bigger philosophical point the game i think is trying to make would be lost on a kid but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you have like Albert Einstein in your house and, I, and you have the smartest kid alive. I, maybe they would understand it or get it. Albert Einstein would get it. He would. Or maybe there's would people he? out there that are like, Andrea, you're missing the point. And maybe I am missing the point. But um, it, it certainly the played. The point is it, there is no point. Right. It certainly played very well on the Switch. Obviously, like I mentioned, this is out on other platforms. But um, I just I'm just trying to figure out what's the point of it all. I mean, it sounds very unique. <laughs> I mean, that's one way of putting it. Yeah, exactly. Unique is the is is a good is a good. Way. I stole it's that from Steimer. I was just using weird. She's uh, like yes. unique. Weird is, I, is unique is what I like to say, and then interesting. <laughs> um, I guess it doesn't technically have a release date yet. It's uh, just slated for. Oh wait, hold on. Does it? I'm looking at this right. January 10th is when it st comes out. So it's out. Mm. It's out today. So it's out. Yes. Because that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Well, we're recording the show on Wednesday. and we're Correct, on Mundo. Friday, so. so if you want to check out the weirdness that is everything, you can find it now on Nintendo Switch. <laughs> but yeah. That's unfortunate SEO because I feel like Googling everything on Switch will never, ever show you your game. It's well, just going to show you. You have to, you have to Google search everything every game. Everything yeah. game. I even tried that too. I'm no, I, I found it. It Did came you? up immediately yeah. for me when I searched everything game. Yeah. Everything game works. Game, game works? Mm. Oh, No, okay, not okay. game works. No. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. I see. I got it. <laughs> and if you need oh, to, you, don't forget about those good old quotation marks. Google loves those. Everything game in quotations. Friend. But yeah. Yes. Um, Steimer, you mm -hmm. have been playing Red Dead Redemption, which we're going to talk about a lot in the third segment. Yes. But I you've finished also been that playing, so that we can uh, talk about it. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Yes. Uh, yeah. So back. as I finish, sorry. I said welcome back. Oh, thank you. Uh, I I I kind of want to read the thing that I had written in our group chat because you got so mad and it made me laugh. Um, this okay. is <laughs> go ahead. Go so, ahead. Well, let me find it first. So I obviously I hopped back into Assassin's Creed after playing um, Red Dead Redemption, and as we've discussed a lot, the horse butts in Red Dead Redemption are fucking ace. They're so good. 
Um, and then I went back to, I don't even know, maybe I won't be able to find it because maybe it was too long ago, but, uh, I went back to Assassin's Creed and I was like, oh my God, these are the ugliest horse butts I've ever seen in my life. The tail is hideous. It's just like, it's just an ugly butt. It's an ugly thing to look at. Uh, and obviously it's not animated as well. And oh yeah uh, all i wrote was the horse butts and ac are so bad in comparison to red dead redemption and andrea goes off bad is relative they have a horse that is literally on fire <laughs> ac isn't trying to be photorealistic i would argue the actual writing is better in ac i don't care if the coat is shiny if i don't have to fucking tap x over and over again to sprint that is the most andrea response to something so simple <laughs> Literally, all I had written was the horse butts are so bad. <laughs> Bro, I maybe had a few glasses of wine when I wrote that response to start. It was, I laughed so hard when I saw it because I was like, this is the most Andrea thing I've ever seen. Oh, God. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's amazing because um, you're correct that the functionality behind writing the horses in Assassin's Creed is better than in Red Dead Redemption because you can just set it and forget it um <laughs> but but that just made me laugh really hard um otherwise assassin's creed i'm still enjoying it i it took me a, a little bit to readjust to the controls as you do with any game where you hop back in you're like how do i play this game again oh i accidentally like slash someone with an axe in town whoops ah just run away real quick everybody forget about it great um, yeah, transitioning from horse riding in Red Dead to AC, you'll accidentally like hit your horse. You're like yeah. swing. <laughs> well, I was swing like, I, I was on the horse, accidentally like swiped my great axe at someone. I was like, oh shit, whoops. Um, but the customization that they have added is so great. It's perfect. It's exactly what I wanted from this game and what I felt like was missing. Because um, I was like, you were guys were so close, so close. And then they came back and they were like, here you go. Blink. Fucking nailed it. Uh, so for those who don't know, the, when you first played Assassin's Creed, you couldn't quite, you could like upgrade a piece of armor and continue wearing it, but it was really never going to change whether or not that rare piece of armor was legendary or whatever. Like there's always going to be better armor than it. You can just keep it to the level. But I had this low piece of armor that I really liked the look of. And I would just keep it there for cutscenes. <laughs> oh, that's right. I Amazing. remember you saying that. <laughs> and uh, so now in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you can go through and uh, just basically, I think it's you hit X. I don't know. You hit a button. I believe it's X. And then you can pick out and it automatically unlocks every skin that you have had, like that you've picked up along the way. And so you can just change whatever the look is of that particular piece of armor, which I was like, yes. It's simple. It's effective. This reminds me of Guild Wars. Good job. You did the damn thing. I mean, then why not let people have that as an option? If they want to spend yeah. like 200 hours in this game, I think that's great. And I'm so glad you brought that up because they also announced a new thing this week. Um, they um, This write-up comes from uh, Ben Kachera over at Polygon. It says that Ubisoft is releasing a variety of new content for Assassin's Creed Odyssey throughout January, most of which is discussed in the video at the top of their post over on Polygon.com. The second episode of Legacy of the First Blade is on the way, along with two new Lost Tales of Greece. There will be new mercenary tiers, a new vendor, adding to the already extensive amount of things to do and earn in the game. But I'm most excited about the upcoming ability to adjust the game's enemy scaling. Ah, that is a good feature. Uh, yeah, Ubisoft itself refers to this option as one of the most community requested features since launch. When the update release is going to be released on January 10th, you'll be able to select from four options that will determine how the enemies scale to your own progress. Heavy, where all the enemies remain at your level. Normal, which is no change in the difficulty settings as they are currently. Light, where content around is two levels below your level. Or very light, where content is four levels below your level. That's that would be great. So, because here is my main critique, like, of Assassin's Creed. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just a frustrating thing as someone who wants to move through it quickly. Is like, you are level gated. So, like, you can't, you have to do some side missions in order to get to where you need to be um, and not get your ass kicked. <laughs> so like, this is interesting to me. Like, what does this, does this mean I can get through this game faster? Cause if so, great. 
because uh, I will say it's funny. You're like, yes, there's more content being added. I'm like, content's not the issue here. There's so much here to do. I don't think I'll ever be able to do it. Yeah. But I, I want to get through the story because this story seems very interesting to me. Yeah, and I'm, I like I'm with you. And I was a little disappointed when I started playing Odyssey and I looked at some of the earlier areas like Cephalonia and I was like, I would like to maybe go back there and do some of the side stuff. But then it's like it, it was at the same level that I'm currently at. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer. I wanted to go back there and just like waste fools. I don't want to like <laughs> actually yeah. like have to use some strategy in combat. There'll be plenty of high level content to come. And I'm so glad that they added this. And it's interesting to me that some of the people are complaining about this. And I'm like, why? Why? It's just it's an completely option. optional. You don't have to turn it on. You can leave the game as it is and be perfectly happy. And they even said that these options are not going to be available in nightmare difficulty to make sure that the challenge is maintained um, and that they're going to be putting warnings in the game that say, quote, this can have unforeseen consequences, such as content being too easy and not providing meaningful rewards. And I think that's really all they would need to do. But if you're intentionally setting the difficulty level lower, you're doing that because that's the experience that you want. It's a single player game. If I want to play on baby ass baby mode, why does that bother you? <laughs> right? I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by this anymore. But why would anyone give a rat's ass how you play a game? Is it, I, I don't, why? People, there's a lot of important things going on in this planet, on, on this planet and in yeah. this planet as well. But in this world, <laughs> why? Oh my god! I don't know, man. But I, I think that sounds that's neat. Fan, yeah, that's a fantastic feature. And I bet going forward, that'll be something we'll see implemented in their games. And it's something I think more games should adopt. That, that, will, like ha that will help little old me actually make it through yeah. the stories of these games. Because I want to. Maybe. Let me love you. I want to break free. That's certainly the game I'm really looking forward to finally taking more time in. I did play a little bit over the break, um, but because I saw that you had finished Red Dead, I was like, let me power through this and, um, and finish it. And it's, my goodness, did it become quite a slog at the end. I talked about this a little bit on the Gamescast this week, but I just really felt like it was i think so it's much because work at the end it's, it's because you didn't play the first game in my opinion i like that's not a bad thing and i'm not like shame there's no shame bell here it's just like i think and i actually have recommended people against it now um in the facebook group somebody was like i'm not enjoying red dead i never played the first i'm like honestly i don't know that you're gonna get what you're looking to get out of it if you didn't play the first the, the yeah. and i don't want to talk about this too much because i think we're gonna have this i really want to dive into it in the yeah. spoiler cast um but that's just kind of my my tip to those who are like oh you know i never played red dead one i'm like if you really like westerns and horses maybe go ahead and give it a shot but this game is very much designed to be a, a companion piece to that one I, I mean, I agree, but I also think part of the reason why it was a slog for Andrea as well, and again, we'll get into this, is you didn't really, I think you appreciated the game, Andrea, but I don't think you were like, oh my God, this is so good. I love the slow pace of it. I like the Sims part of it. I like that I can just do anything, go fishing and hunting. Ah, like that wasn't your cup of tea. And as we'll talk about in the, in the epilogue, it, it maintains that pace. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, it's like you just, you're playing it just to finish it. You're not playing it because you were excited about it, right? If we weren't having the spoiler cast, would you have even finished it? No. Yeah. So Honestly, yeah. So, I would yeah. not have finished it. Yeah. I would have just, I would have just watched a, like a recap video or asked one of you what the end was. I mean, I partially watched John play through the end, like, like when it came out, like over a month ago, uh, two months ago now. And I, so I saw a lot of what happened. Um, I didn't see the end of the epilogue, you know, which we're going to talk about, but it was just like, OMG. So we'll okay, save that for the I'm next like, can segment. Can we just go move it to the spoiler cast? Can we go to the uh, break We'll now? get there. But I want to hear about Bury Me, My Love, since this is a ah, game yes. that I've been very interested in. And Britt, you, have you finished it or have you just started it? Yeah. So this game actually has 19 endings. So Whoa. You, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a lot of ways to bury your love. <laughs> oh, sad. So... Bury Me, My Love follows a Syrian family. Well, in particular, it's a husband and a wife, and you assume the role as the husband, and your wife is trying to flee. And um, the developer, Pixel Hunt, 
did a lot of research and actually consulted with Syrian refugees. So this is a lot. Everything this you is see a lot is, more serious than I thought it yeah. was. Oh, sorry. So. I thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> nope. So, okay, well, yeah. never mind. I will see myself into the corner. Don't worry about me. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> So everything that happens in this game, all of the scenarios are based off of circumstances that people found themselves in. So it's heavy and it's a lot. Uh, So you are, this is a texting game where you are texting with your wife and most of the game you're just watching the conversation flow. I played on Nintendo Switch, by the way. This comes out, I think, the 10th of January on Switch. So it would be out by the time this podcast releases. Other times, though, you get the opportunity to try to sway her decision. What should she do? Um, The cab driver is now trying to charge her too much to get to a new city. Do you tell her, just fork over the extra money? Or do you say, try to find a cheaper option? Or maybe she'll find herself in a van full of refugees and a family. And do you tell her, this is shady, you should get out? Or do you tell her to stick along for the ride? This is too much pressure. Yeah, and... I played it through once, maybe took an hour, hour and a half. I was kind of playing it off and on, so I wasn't keeping track of my time. And I got a very, very, very sad ending when that um, it consisted of her calling, and it was basically a final phone call, and it was devastating. I was like, this is so sad. So it's a texting thing, and I played on the Switch, like I said. The, the problem playing on the Switch is that when I went for my second – playthrough the game crashed on me about four or five times oh no and I Mm. think it was because of the path I had chosen the the decisions I had made because the first time I played it didn't crash at all but there was one particular uh dialogue piece that I could not get past and what's frustrating about this is that this game doesn't have checkpoints so I mean it, it, it does but what I mean is after you play it the first time you can't just pick up from anywhere within the game you have to start all the way over and there's no way to fast forward through these messages so a lot of the time you're going to be seeing the same conversations that you saw before I mean that said I still had a, a, a it was you know a very emotional dramatic serious game but um I think it's really good what they've done. What I would recommend is instead of paying the $5 for it on Switch, just pay the $3 on your mobile device. And it just has a few more features that make the experience a little more enjoyable. And you can even turn on this really cool um, system where she will text you. I don't know if it's necessarily real time, but when you play on Switch, it's like text after text after text. And then if five or six hours pass, you'll just see a little screen with a clock going by. But in this one, if you send her a text message and she's like, okay, I'm catching my cab, and you turn on push notifications, she might not text you for another 15 or 20 minutes. Hmm. And then you'll see it on your phone. So it's it's like you're having a real conversation. And during some particularly tense moments, you're like, oh, my God, like, are you going to text me? Did you make it? It's like real life. Also, <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Real life simulator. You can also uh, turn that off on your iOS or device. I'm playing on an iPhone, too. Um, I definitely enjoyed my time with it on iPhone more than on Switch. But either way, if you have an opportunity to play this, I think it's really neat what they did. And it's it's beautiful. And it's fun to see the chemistry between these two characters because they are husband and wife. And it's really fun. And every time you play, you'll learn more and more about these characters depending on what paths you go down and what decisions you make. So, yeah. Good times. Sad. Sad. I was like, is it good times? It's it's a good time to play it. Sad that sure. it's based off of reality, but I think yeah. it's that uh, I think even some teachers I saw in classrooms were using this as like a, an educational tool as well. So pretty cool stuff. Interesting. Yeah, it's certainly one of those kind of games for impact type of games that I've 100%. heard a lot about. That um, I'm going to check out. I probably will play it on iOS. Thanks for the recommendation. Seems mm-hmm. like the most convenient way to play because mobile games are the future, ladies and gentlemen, if you missed Boom. my tirade about that earlier in the show. <laughs> all right. Um, because we all are champing at the bit to talk about Red Dead Redemption Ooh. 2. See what I did there? Yeah, um, girl. <laughs> we're going to take one more short break and I'm going to go get a beverage because we're going to be talking probably quite a bit. And if you have not finished Red Dead Redemption 2 and you don't want the game to be spoiled for you, Um, maybe this is where we say goodbye to you and we see you next week but hopefully um, you'll stick around and you'll listen to our conversation and uh, enjoy what we have to say until then we'll see you just after the break What's 
good, everybody, and welcome back. It's the third segment of the What's Good Games podcast, and it's the long-awaited spoiler cast for Red Dead Redemption 2 from Rockstar Games. As I mentioned at the end of the last segment, which was just mere seconds ago, this is a spoiler cast. We will be spoiling everything in Red Dead Redemption 2. The beginning, the middle, the end, and the two-part epilogue. So God help me if I don't lose my shit by the end of this. Um, we're going to be talking about it all. So if you're like, I'm not ready for that, you should probably just say, hey, thanks so much. It's been a great podcast, and I'm going to head out bye, now. Bye, bye, You've, yeah, bye. Yeah, exactly. Bye, bye, You've been warned sufficiently. All right, time to get into it. But before we do that, we want to give a huge thank you and shout out one more time to our fantastic Turbo patrons for the month of January. We love you guys. If you guys want to get your own personal shout out, head on over to patreon.com slash what's good games and we will read your name probably wrong in this <laughs> monthly list. <laughs> it's part of our, our best charm. to uh, pronounce your name. So let's begin, shall we? Yeah. With Aaron Saxton. Adrian Williams. Alberto Andres Videla. Alex Regopoulos. Andrew Cotton. Andrew Susan. Anthony Murphy. Aurelia Furman. Bill Stillwell. Billy Shibley. Brian Harper. Brooke Larie Asia Harris. Carl Peterson. Kathy Lucas. Cool Red Daddy. Christian Rodriguez. Dale Sun. David Icalucci. Dominic Weller. Donatio Sinaccio III. Dustin Lewis. E. Benjamin Checkness. E. Izari. Elizabeth Brooke. Elmo Shell. Emily Kent. Eric Guerrero. <laughs> Ferris, sorry, yeah. sorry, Eric. <laughs> Ferris was mine to read, but it's okay. Oh shit! I'll sorry. read Geo, I'll read Geo Corsi. Gregory Horton, <laughs> Ivan Beharano, Jared Howard, Jasmine Lee, Jason Davis, Jay Mahui, Jason Demers, Jesse Spencer, Joe Kennison, Joe Schleif, John Drake. Oh, I get to read him twice. <laughs> Joselle Vasa, <laughs> Kevin Dunkel, Kia B. Lewis Creech, Lincoln Davis, Lincoln Thurber, Lucas Cheney, Mark Drastrup, Martha Emery, Matthew Goddard, Melanthius Owens, Michael Shenholtz, Muhammad Fahim Muhammad, Male Bittner, Nambue, Nicole Humphrey, Noel Navarez, Ozzy Mejia, Paige Porter, Patrick Landry, Patrick Weller, Pete Shoemaker, Professor Medicare. <laughs> Punk defied. Pure blue octopus. Blah, 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 blah. RJ Bryan. <laughs> Regan Imsen. Ripped Gamers. Rob Leonard. Roland Bala. Ross Haney. Ryan B. Sam. Simon <laughs> Bergston. <laughs> Dion Stevenson. Steph Wu. Stephanie Fitzwilliam. I think this is a Stephanie DuPont. Sydney Carr. Timu Nikonen. Teresa Enert. Timothy Bennett. Tommy Larson. Trent Pennington. Snarky Starkey. Oh, yeah. Tyler McCall. Will Hernandez. And Zach Hershey. It was alphabetical yes. that time by first name. Um, yeah. Thank you again so much to all of our wonderful Turbo patrons. Again, one more time, patreon.com slash what's good games. We cannot do what's good games without you. So if you like listening to us have shenanigans, funny stuff, and some really ridiculous conversations about the way horse butts animate, then maybe you want to support the show by dropping us a couple bucks at patreon.com slash what's good games. All right, without further ado, I feel like I need to play that <laughs> Western music. Oh my God. You're welcome. Ah! There's the horse in the background. Ah! That was Marian. a dolphin horse. That's definitely a dolphin, not a horse. Nay! <laughs> Okay, um, Andrea, I love you, but we have lots of requests for you not to eat while we're shooting the show. It's one bite of jerky, and then I'm not eating anything else. Okay. I literally have nothing else to eat in the studio. Also, no. who's making these requests? I'm a hungry person. People on iTunes giving those one-star reviews. Oh, no. Um, nom, nom. A one-star no review? Reason. That's no reason for a one-star review. I don't eat on the show every week. It's just every once in a while. Hey, I, I know, but these are not people that, that think normally that we're talking about. I support you in your eating habits 100%. It's not me. Okay, I want to talk about Red Dead. Okay. <laughs> so how do we start this? Because 
Good Lord, I have a lot of things to say, but I'm not sure where okay. to kick off. Okay. So I so we should preface this. Andrea and Simer just recently finished this. I finished this back in October? November? November. It came November? out October 26th. Yeah, I did not finish it that soon. So definitely in November. I'm I was lying. a little that rusty. That was Assassin's Creed release date. When did this come out? October 13th? No. What's the release date of this game? October. I don't remember. 20. Yeah, I don't fucking remember. It's been 80 days and 80 nights. Well, 80 years. I don't know. It's been 84 years. October. I no, believe. it was October 26th. Yeah. 2016. Okay. 2018. So I, <laughs> I watched some things and I got a refreshed, refreshed memory. And then watching all these cutscenes, oh my God, I got really sad really fast. Because. Dude, it's so <sighs> fucking depressing. Like. The whole arc, I immediately, I was so glad you had finished it, Brittany, because as soon as I, well, actually, let's just, okay, I guess, do we just talk about what happens? Well, do you yes. want, do, we probably shouldn't start at the end, right? Why we not? Probably I want to talk about that. <laughs> we should probably start with some of the, the, the major beats. So, obviously, the story centers around new protagonist, Arthur Morgan. <laughs> He's part of the Dutch Vandalin gang. We all know this, and there's a bunch of other members of the gang. So you're on the run from the law from a crime that you committed in Blackwater and you don't ever actually that go to wrong. Blackwater during the main game because LOL, why would you ever go back there? Because there's supposed to be money hidden there. That was a, a big gripe I had that we never actually went to Blackwater. And then you jump into Red Dead Online unwittingly. You're in Blackwater. I'm like, oh, spoilers. <laughs> Wait, didn't Dutch go back to Blackwater and get the money, though? That's I think at one point they say Dutch went back to Blackwater took and took the money. That's why there's no reason to go back there. I mean, according to the story. Did he? That's why uh, it, I think that there was still theory. No, he kept saying it was still there, but like, th we just need a little more money. We just need more money. I've okay. got a plan. You're like, shut the fuck up, Dutch. I could be wrong, but I believe Abigail told Arthur he went back and got the money. She overheard a conversation, which is why... In the ending, where if you go back for the money, it's there. And she gives you the Wait, key. Wait, no. I mean, publicly, he I wasn't. I don't think he was, like, touting that. But, oh, yes, sure, he, sure, do, sure. he does have the money. It is in a cave. He, like, hides it near him. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, pu like, to the, to the gang, it's like, no, we don't know. No, the money's still tied up. We still need more. Which, I'm no, <laughs> you don't. Anyway. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Okay, so the camp. Camp focus. That's a story beat we want to talk about. Yeah, so let's talk about the camp mechanic to start with. What did you two think about the whole rigmarole of building the camp, upgrading the camp, really kind of creating a camaraderie with your gang mates? What's uh, clan yeah, mates? Your, gang your members? Crew. I don't know. Okay. At first, I was spending a lot of my time in camp checking out what conversations I could see and witness um, and trying to build up, you know, what I could, donating a lot of my money. I wanted everyone to like me. I liked it when I walked by and they gave me positive reinforcement. But what I found myself not caring about were the cosmetics um, additions you could make, you know, if you wanted to put the skulls above like a tree or if you wanted to give someone a cowhide rug or whatever it was. I didn't really care enough. What I did do was upgrade all of the um, – was it like the I gave myself like a fast travel. I upgraded all the little stations or whatever they were, and that was as far as it went for me. So as far as the upgrading part of it, I I upgraded it as much as I could, like with that gave me in game benefits. But after that, I didn't care enough to do that. Same, yeah, same. I, and I definitely I think that it was really cool the way like you would just stumble upon people's conversations, and if you walked close enough to them, you would initiate. Uh, or you would like jump in a little bit automatically. Um, it was just interesting to see those dynamics brewing and like seeing who kind of got along, who did not get along, what was going on there. Um, but yeah, once I upgraded the camp uh, to Brittany's point, I was kind of done with it. Um, didn't care about the cow skin rocks. <laughs> The cow skin but rug. I think that's fine. Most people, I, I don't really it was, think that's To me, it was very for. clear that those activities were designed for somebody who wants to spend 500 hours in this game. Yeah. Because a lot of the skins that you need to acquire, the perfect skins that you need to acquire, by the way, in order yeah. to get those, it seemed like such busy work that I was like, nah, dog, I'm good. Yeah, you got to like tag the thing through and then go hunt it down and not put too many bullets in it. And you're like, eh. Yeah. 
going off of the camp focus, I mean, this is based off of that, but just the dynamic of those characters, like you were saying, Simer, just the conversations you'd find, I think those were some of my most memorable moments because I knew, I had a feeling going into this game that, sure, everyone's here, like, we just suffered some losses, obviously some shit in Blackwater went down, but everyone's here, our morale is high. I, I had a feeling that as the game goes on, everyone's probably going to fucking end up dead. So knowing that, I really appreciated the moments when everyone was alive and together and happy. And there were some of those moments in the beginning when Karen would be singing by herself in front of the fire after a big party, everyone was drunk and stumbled off to bed. But she was just singing a very sad song by herself in front of a fire. And I just watched her sing it. And I was like, ooh, that was pretty moving. And then there was this other moment after another random time I came back to camp and everyone was drunk again. Everyone stumbled off to their own little campsites and uncle was out there. It was uncle or Bill uh, sitting by the campfire by himself and just singing this song about, um, I even wrote it down. He said, uh, to our beloved West, we say goodbye. And then like the thunder just cracked at that moment above and it started raining. And I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I got goosebumps. I was like, oh my God, because obviously knowing what happens in Red Dead Redemption, you know, you're right. The West is gone you know outlaws are yeah. no longer a thing you can't just run around the the world the country doing what you want surprise like and uh that was super crazy and i had a lot of those moments around the camp where i just saw these interactions that i just stumbled across and it was yeah. just oh. that was the main reason why i ever ever wanted to go back to camp was to see what was going on with everybody there and to see what new conversations i could find like when i would go back Be like ooh, is like something gonna go down is Abigail going to yell at John? Like, or is like, <laughs> or like, what's going on here? Like someone's, someone's yelling at someone usually. Uh, when you have as many people as there are in camp, which is a decent number, there's always going to be people butting heads. But then what you're saying about the singing was really cute. I remember when you moved to, is it the second or the third camp where it's the house? Um, and like Javier starts singing and they all just have like a really nice um, moment, moment together. And there just there were a lot of little things like that where you did feel attachment to these characters, and I think I had before I really got you know too deep into the game. I remember thinking how horrifying it was going to be for me at the end because I thought, oh no, this is going to turn the character I love, John Marston, into some sort of like yeah. monster because how could you essentially like turn your back on like a group that you've been with for so long um i don't feel that way anymore good yeah the the but. arc of john marston throughout this game is, is really fascinating and, and we'll get to that in just a second um, i want to talk about the first major beat of the game that really got me hooked on the story because if you guys remember when we first all started playing this i was having a really tough time getting into it it was painfully slow in the first two chapters of the game and it wasn't until we got to Rhodes that I really started getting invested in the gang and invested in the story where it really started to pick up so you do a successful bank heist in Valentine and then you have a shootout with Cornwall and his men and then of course the gang is forced to relocate when Agent Milton discovers the location of their camp which another plot hole after he runs into Arthur and Jack fishing by the river he easily could have just followed them back to wherever camp was because turns out camp was totally really close. and he did right up the right up the road <laughs> but then the game would be really short um so in Rhodes they of course meet the two families the Grays and the Braithwaite's and I thought this was a really fun little arc between these two families because it just um it made for a good old-fashioned rivalry kind of reminded me a little bit of like a Romeo and Juliet kind of esque mm -hmm. and I think they even reference Romeo Romeo and Juliet, there, right? There is literally a quest line that is basically Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. So and these two rival families, two of course, Dutch is like, let's play both sides and pit them against each other because they're He's totally just never going to find out. He's just egotistical maniac. Like, he just thinks he can get away with murder, which he has for a very long time, oh, yeah. to be fair. But, like, it's one of those people where they just vastly overestimate their skills. And it's not to say that they're not skilled. Dutch is clearly a silver-tongued master, but... You got to know your limits, man. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. Um, and clearly the the first kind of limit that comes to them is when Sean gets killed. And I, mm-hmm. that death was really kind of took me by surprise. I mean, I think we all knew going in that clearly not all the gang members are going to make it to the end, right? Yeah. Somebody's like, got to die in this out. game. Fucking Bill. Um, but yeah, I was just like, I was like, how, it happened so quickly. It felt like it just like poof out of the blue. He was, he was gone. And then you get into this firefight. It was really intense. and kind of put you in an emotional place. I watched all of the death scenes before we shot this. And I remember specifically when Sean was shot in the head. I was, this is not good. I mean, Bill brokered this deal with the, was it the Grays, I think? And, and Arthur Morgan's like, yo, dog, we just burned their fields. They, and Bill's like, oh, they don't know that's us. And we sold their horses. Oh, that's fine. And then they're just having a conversation. And Sean's just like, you think this is, and then kaboom, his head is just gone. And then he lays yeah. down. And then Bill's like, you think he's dead? And Arthur's like, of course he's dead. Look at him. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> of course he's dead. But it, like you said, Andrea, it was so sudden. And it just, you weren't expecting it. Usually, like, in that sort of instance, you're kind of expecting, like, a gunshot or something. But yeah. bam. Oh, my God. And then I, don't, the- like, I wasn't emotionally torn up about that one. Uh, mostly because it wasn't a character that you cared like, about. You cared about that much. You just didn't like uh, his accent. Admit it. I was just like. I Shut liked up. him. No, I'm just kidding. No, he was, silly. He he was nice fine. Relief. Yeah, he was fine. He was, he was fine. the definition of fine. But um, <laughs> I do think it was it was a shock. It was a jolt to the system because it was just the timing of it and the way that they they put it together that way. But I wasn't like, oh, I'm so sad. Sean's dead. Um, and I felt that way with a couple of the people where I'm like, you were just they definitely bloated the gang in my mind so that they could thin the gang. And obviously you knew going into it, if you played Red Dead Redemption, Bill makes it out, Javier makes it out, Dutch makes it out. Like you knew those things going in. I wouldn't say they bloated it just to kill them off. I would say that those characters added a lot because I liked, I liked Sean's little like Irish quips, right? And the relationship between him and Karen, it was fun to watch those two bicker. And when I saw his death, I was like, dang, like I'm not going to get any more of those. Did you guys Mm -hmm. see that when they went in the tent and boinked? No. Yeah. They go in a tent and they boink. Oh, oh no! And Poor they're all, Karen. They're all very drunk. They totally had a thing for each other, and it was really oh, funny to watch. Oh, that makes them. me sad now. Yeah, that's sad. Anyway, I think that yeah, I didn't, I didn't get that. So, so well, I, I, the, the Grace and Braithwaite. I also like we were talking about. I love those two characters. The I can't remember their name. I'm sorry because it's been 84 years or however long. It's but, been 84 uh, years. I you wish- mean um the 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 boy and the girl? Yeah, yeah. So it's Penelope oh. and ooh, what's his name? Oh my god! I just finished this quest. I should know it, but I don't remember. I know because I just did a. The, I just did one of Penelope's because I. I almost didn't do her last. The last mission for those two. Bo. His name is Bo. Bo. That's right. Bo. And I really liked their story. I thought it was really cute. And I really liked Penelope as a character. I thought she was really progressive, and it was fun to see that in uh, that 1899. And same with Bo, but uh, I wish we would have seen a little bit more. I feel like if there was some content cut out of Red Dead to you, like it could have been something expanding on them, because I thought that they had a really fun story and chemistry, and then they leave, and then that's kind of it. You never hear from them again, which I guess is okay. But I would have liked to have seen more of them. I feel like there should have been more. Maybe yeah, well, I mean, you I kind feel like there of was a long pause. both of those houses to the ground. One of them, quite literally, right? So, yeah. like, yeah. Grandma Braithwaite kidnaps Jack, which was a pretty surprise turn of events for me. That I'm like, how did they get Jack away from camp? Like, was nobody like looking after him? How did you nobody let the Braithwaites get children? so close to camp? I mean, but they're supposed to have like a perimeter, like around the camp, right? Like right. a security thing. And it was like, I was like, okay, I guess it makes sense that you know they're gonna kidnap him. I was just like. Please, Rockstar, don't hurt the kid. Like, don't do anything to him. Like, make sure he's okay. Well, you okay. knew Jack was fine, too. Yeah, and obviously he was fine. Um, but, like, um, I, I thought that that was a really fun moment. The first moment that, like, the whole gang is coming together. And you have that that epic cutscene where they're all, yeah. like, walking down that tree-lined yeah, ride. road. Right? And mm-hmm. they've all got their guns. And they're like, we're here to fuck shit up. You know? it's It was really yeah, that cool. that was awesome. Yeah, I think with when any of this stuff with Jack happens, I mean, granted, he's so young in this that I don't know, but it did make me wonder, like, how this shapes him as a human being for the next games. You know, like, oh, is is he like 
weird and quiet and reserved because he did spend some time with this Italian mobster? Or like, is it, is it, a th- or are yeah. you, or are you so young at that point that it's just, you're a blank slate and, and you forget it. You're a goldfish. Like you forget. I don't know. I'm not that up to speed on children's <laughs> development. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, speaking of Jack kind of going off a bit, I thought it was so fascinating when you run into Edgar Ross the first time when you're fishing. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, with Arthur. So, Wait, Ed- so who's Andrea- this guy? Edgar Ross is okay. So in Red Dead Redemption, Edgar Ross is the one that you're that essentially kills John Marston. And after three years, not three years later, I don't know how many years later, three, I think about three years later, you are Jack Marston. That's how you who you play in the epilogue. And then you get your revenge on Edgar Ross and you kill him. You, in, a, in a shootout. It's very satisfying. Yeah, it, it's very, very shootout. A uh, shootout. It's very, very satisfying. And so when you see little Jack and then you see Edgar Ross approaching him and there is this exchange like, well, I think Edgar Ross just says a few things to Jack. I was like, oh, shit, sir. That little kid's going to fuck you up someday. Literally, he's going to kill you because you're going to kill his dad and he's going to be very, very sad about it and mad and angry. He's going to get his redemption and shoot you in the face. Um, yes. I thought that was a pretty uh, cool moment to see that. Just yeah, it's interesting the way that they allowed those two characters to meet. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. That was and, my first, like, and holy shit moment. So he found him when he was fishing, and you find him when he's fishing, and you oh, kill him when right, he's fishing. Oh, you're right. I forgot about that. He's retired, trying to live he's a good retired. life. He's retired. And you're like, no, motherfucker. We're going to fucking. You're like, oh. suck it. Here's God. my gun. It's in your face. You're dead. That was That's good. for killing my daddy. Yeah. So, like, they, did, they actually did a lot of really interesting mirroring things in Red Dead Redemption 2 with other arcs, which we'll get to. Um, but I always, I think that's really clever, like, what they did with those. Yeah, it was very nice. So that also, brings us to what, Brittany? Oh no, say Uncle dies at the end of Red Dead Redemption. If you didn't know, for those of you who are listening, he uh, he's apparently yep. I don't I didn't remember him at all. Uh, Samer and I were talking about. <laughs> I this. also don't remember we're him. Like, was, it was Uncle so weird. in Red Dead Redemption, and then he was. I think he's there the whole game, and then he, he dies at the very end. He's a uh, shot during the final shootout. But so. It's so funny. I was like, oh, that's bizarre to me. He's that- gotten so lucky staying alive that long, quite frankly. I know. Of all people, a fucking I uncle. Know. The one who I feel like doesn't know his actual Drunk on uncle, ground. like the literal definition of drunk uncle. Yeah. Um. So this brings us to saint uh, the New Orleans knockoff town in this world where Jack has been kidnapped by the Braithwaite's and given to this guy, Bronte, who is, as Steimer mentioned, an Italian mobster. Um, I had unexpectedly stumbled upon Santini before getting to this point in the story. And I was very clearly yeah. like, nope, st- I'm not supposed to be here yet. <laughs> um, so I, I left there. I went but- there because I was like, it's got the nice tailor. I want to get some new clothes. I know, right? <laughs> I was like, mm, the gunsmith, let's do this. Um, so, of course, there's um, more side missions. You meet some new weird characters. This is where, in saint is where I found the vampires. Did you guys ever find the I've vampires? I've never found the vampires. I never found them, no. I've heard of them. People mentioned them in, like, other quests that I did, but I never found them. Yeah, so I was just out riding in the swamps, like, um, trying to get alligator skins, I think, or something or maybe I was going on one of the side quests, uh, going to pick something up for somebody. And um, I had gotten off my horse to go like get closer to something. And then this this girl started screaming. And then she started running at me and her face was all white. And she had these crazy teeth. And she was just like, ah! and I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And then um, there was like three more of them all trying to like kill me. And I was like, oh, no. this is, these are definitely the vampires of Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, it was, uh, I, I think that's what makes Red Dead really special and why I think it deserves a lot of accolades is because those, those special narrative moments that are unique to each individual's playthrough. I think they should be applauded, but also are a little bit infuriating Because there are some moments that I've heard other people had that I got really kind of upset that I didn't get to have. And I part of me wishes that they weren't procedurally or randomly generated. I actually don't know how those narrative events spawn in the world. Like what is the tech behind that or how you get them to spawn. But I remember watching the Ku Klux Klan scene as John played through it through it and was like, oh, I can't wait to watch all the Klan members burn. It's going to be such a fun scene because it's so funny and stupid. 
And then I never got it. It never spawned. I never for got me. it either. I, I never saw that. it. Yeah, I think it just comes to right place, right time. And so I yeah, I understand because this is the kind of game, at least for me, and I'm probably for you ladies, we won't play this again because it's such a big game and we have things to do. It would have been cool to maybe been able to buy with obviously in game currency, like a tip sheet or something that would said like, Hey, like at this time you should come come here to see something kind of stupid or whatever and you could have followed that. Or like the rumors are saying the that something is around something here like that, or whatever. That was a hilarious scene and I replayed that scene over and over again. I I let them set themselves on fire. I shot them before you could do anything and then reading the notes on them. Oh my God, it was so good. And I'm sad I didn't get the vampires because I remember when we were, we were coming home from somewhere, Andrea, you, Simon, and I, and we were all pretty tipsy. And you're like, did you see the vampires in Red Dead? And John was like, whoa, spoilers. But I was like, no, that's cool. And I was looking forward to seeing the vampires, but I never even heard them, anyone talk about it before. So I didn't even get close to that one. It would have been nice. Yeah, but. outside outside of Saint Denis in the swamps to like the northeast. If you want to try to go find them, that's where they spawned for me um, in those weird shacks. There was also a shack where I was out walking and this guy was on his porch and he like called out to me and he was like, hey, why don't you come over here? And I was like, oh, I'm trying to be an honorable person. Why don't I go over and say something nice? And then, of course, he like clubbed me on the face and like dragged me into his hut. And who knows what happened? I woke up like in the field like the next morning, like without Wait, my did clothes. Did you have both kidneys? Yeah, I was like, "What the hell was that?" And what's crazy is that there was oh, something weird. that happened to me in the very end of the game, um, in the epilogue, as I was playing um, in Blackwater. Uh, I got off my horse and I was walking over to the saloon, and I heard this um, this. Um, like this woman and this man clearly like they were getting robbed or something was happening to them on the street so I was like oh let me go over there and help them and by, I had pulled my gun out and by the time I got around the corner the uh, the robber shot the wife and so I shot the robber and I walked over there and the the man is on the ground like weeping over the body of his wife and I'm like oh my god I was literally like just a few seconds too slow in getting over there to save them and I was like well I had just booted up my game from not playing I was like oh why don't I reload into the game and then I'll just rush right over there and I'll save them so I can save her and so I did it I booted up the game and I walked over there they weren't there that uh. that that instance didn't spawn the second time I loaded up my game and it was it's fascinating because it's on one hand, it's like, oh, it's really cool that they've made each experience unique and that you can't change the output of what happens just like in real life, like shit happens. And once it happens, it happens. There's no going back. But on the other hand, I'm like, I hate that that's the way the tech works. You know, like it makes me really angry because I'm like, no, I want to save her. Let me just fucking save her. She's dead, Andrea. She's she dead. Does. Let her go. Well, yeah, in, my, in the new instance, though, I took solace. Sorry, Brittany, just to finish no, this. No, no. In yeah. the new instance, I took solace in the fact that she never was threatened at all in the new instance. She never had to go through that. So she's alive somewhere living That's true. a happy That's life. Perfect. Living her best life. Yeah. yeah. No, I have nothing to add to that. That's awesome. Yeah. But so uh, we were talking about Saint Denis. Uh, oh, yeah. The Pinkertons, of course, are back. And then. Um, this is kind of where Hosea kind of takes a little bit more of a step forward um, in the story. And I really like Hosea as a character. I think he's the glue that's clearly holding the gang together because Dutch is a little bit of a hothead. And while he's the mastermind behind all the movements the gang makes, Hosea is really the brains of the operation. And it's clear that... Jose is losing his influence with Dutch and the Dutch is at this point just really starting to go off the rails a little bit and you start to question what Dutch's motives really are and why he's really keeping Jose and Arthur who have been his like best buds for a long time at arm's length and why Micah fucking Micah, fucking Micah. <laughs> um, fucking is becoming Micah. you know more influential and so this is really like chapter three to chapter four is really where the story turns and in hindsight and I've said this now and we've talked about it on, on the show before I wish I would have known to go around the open world and do all of the side quests and maybe go after the legendary animals and do more exploring before this point 
Because from here, it's when shit really starts to get crazy. And then, of course, um, you know, Arthur gets sick. But before that, we've got fucking Gorma. Ah, uh, yeah, Gorma. So now this happens, I believe I have my timeline correct, right after Hosea and Lenny are killed. Yeah. Which, and by every- the way, so fucking sad. Not only is it sad that Lenny really is killed sad. right after you do this amazing fun drunk mission Dude. you guys do you remember oh, that yeah. mission where you get wasted with lenny that was yes, such a good lenny! mission that was one of my favorite <laughs> parts of, and i wish for i don't know if i mentioned him i don't think i did but i would have nominated him for best npc for our game of the words nomination because he was so fun and that mission was so great and the way hosea went out and died is so sad i just rewatched this a couple hours ago and he knows he's going to be killed and he's kind of like looking at Dutch and I feel like Arthur and the gang one last time and he's kind of like huddled over because he's really sick and then he looks behind him to look at uh, was it Milton that killed him I don't one of those assholes killed him Milton and then, yeah Milton kills him Milton killed yeah and uh then they just shoot him and he's on the ground and then he's dead and I was like god damn and it I was like not Hosea he's so nice and then they Ugh. killed Lenny and I was like god damn it and then poor Lenny poor Lenny like oh why did dropping like flies yeah, Lenny didn't know. Did he, he never saw it coming. He was just like Aww. looking back on the guys at the rooftops and then kaboom, there he goes. And, you know, Arthur's like, oh, they got Lenny in. Fucking Dutch. There's nothing we can do for him now. Blah, blah, blah. So obviously. I mean, I mean he also leaves John. Dutch. Oh, sorry. Yeah. To, be, to clarify, yeah. this is where John gets essentially left behind. Yeah, the first time. Um, but <laughs> the first Oh, poor John. He gets fucked over left, right, and center. Um, but at least he's not dead yet yeah he's not dead yet so obviously they're all hiding out and then like you said andrew i think this is when micah starts to kind of like weasel his way in obviously what we find out was after guarma he teams up with the pinkertons to rat on everyone but yeah they get on the ferry and then or the ferry or the boat whatever the hell it crash lands into guarma and i just feel like this whole part of the game was so unnecessary and it I was kind of weird i don't know why this was in the game i honestly don't get it i mean Unless you wanted, I don't know. I can't think of any story reason to put this in the game. I'm trying to do my Brit it's, thing, but I can't no, do you, it. I love that you're trying to be positive I about it. I said I it. can't do it. I can't. It's, it's so just, superfluous. Like, I just don't even know why. So for just as like a refresher, yeah. if you guys also finished the game a while ago, a torrential storm sinks the ship. The men wash ashore the Isle of Guarma, where they become embroiled in a war. Because they're supposed to be war. going to Cuba, to be clear. Yes, yeah, so yeah. they're supposed to be going to Cuba. So there's a tyrannical sugar plantation owner and the enslaved local population. The group successfully aids the revolution against the plantation owners and secures transport back to the United States. And they reunite with the gang. So while you're on Guarma, it's like, whose side are you fighting for? Why do you even care? What's the whole point of it all? You're in the jungle. It's just... The saving grace is that it was fairly short. Yeah, I get... Yeah, but, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it does... You're, you're both are correct in that, like, you're kind of just like, what? Like, you were... Like, I think what would have made more sense is if the ship had gone to another part of the continent that they were on. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, we have to hold up here. We're far away enough. Let's start making our way back. And by that time, enough time will have passed. And then you kind of go through that land to get to where you're going. But to create this whole separate island with these characters that you'd never really hear from again, unless I forgot something, it no. just makes no no sense. It, I don't know. They literally I, were just looking for a time has passed button. And yeah. that they decided to put it on this Isle of Forma. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was because it was they just dumb. needed them to be far enough away. They needed a reason where they would be far away unable to contact anybody else and stay there for a prolonged period of time so that everybody else would think that they're dead. 100%. Like that's, well, that's all I needed. Yeah, and there were so many know. other realistic ways, I think, to do that, that this whole thing just seems so uh, so unrealistic. And granted, it's a video game, but I feel like Red Dead tries to follow a realistic story. So this just was like, this is fucking weird. This is something you'd find in old Western back in the day that probably didn't do very well. Like, oh, yeah. look at this grand adventure we're on. No. Well, I think the key takeaway from this plot point is that John Marston is captured and is now imprisoned. Yes. And you, in the back of your mind, are like, well, we have to go get him. We've got to break him out. It's John. Like, he's a key member of the gang. And so when you finally get back from from Guarma, um, that, of course, is 
your number one priority is Arthur, but Dutch doesn't think he's worth saving. And it's this is also, really where Dutch goes down what I think is like the dark path. Yeah, it's the darkest timeline. But Dutch also mentions before, um, I think he's on the rooftops or when they're holed up in the building waiting to get on the boat to Cuba. Dutch is like trying to plant in your head as Arthur that John's a rat. He was like, I don't know the, the way they took him, whatever. Someone needed to tip them off. They didn't kill him. Maybe it's because he's been working with them. And I think it's actually, it was really interesting even, you know, to kind of backtrack a little bit. Their, Arthur and John's relationship throughout the whole game is an interesting arc because the, the beginning, there's definitely jealousy there. Arthur is jealous of John. And he's jealous of John because John is still a golden child, golden boy, even though at some point prior in their history as a group, as a gang, um, he left for like a year. Uh, I don't remember exactly what they say he was doing, but he just peace out and yeah. then came back also and an just was like yeah. hugs come on back boy you're home now and arthur is not down for that also in a journal entry that uh i don't think this had anything to do with because obviously he has his other woman he does mention that he would have been interested in abigail had john not come around mm. also can we talk for a second about the journal and how the game never prompts you to look at the journal literally fucking ever and if you it don't does. take the time to like f like physically go to the journal on your own, that like you just miss all of that content. Well, you get a it prompt that says new journal it. entry. Or like, if you go to sleep, it, then you wake up and it's like you got a new journal entry. Go read it. I I I must be I must be completely Did you never oblivious. Sleep? <laughs> I don't recall ever seeing that prompt on my screen at any I point. Know. I'm not even uh, shitting you. Oh no, that I sucks. definitely got them, and I would go through and read them. When it told me to. Uh, the only time I ever got prompted to do journal entries was when I was out exploring and I came across like a place where he wanted to do a sketch of uh, the place yeah, that I was at. Oh, things. that's weird. Yeah, def that sucks because I feel like the journal provides so much insight and in especially Arthur as a character and how he's growing and changing. That yep. Sucks. Yeah. yeah. Man, maybe I should go back and just read yeah, Arthur's you should, journal. Actually. Yeah, there's no. a lot of good stuff no, in there. No, I'm not gonna. Oh dang, I'm not you're not going to. You're not, <laughs> you, don't, you don't care enough. <laughs> Rat. No, wah, man, wah. I got, I got, um, I got mythological creatures in Greece to go slay. <laughs> um, but um, we were talking about that. This is the turning point for turning Dutch, point where for he Dutch. kind of goes down. The and weird at this point, after path. Guarma, we know that Micah is working with the Pinkertons. We know that they have Molly. And Micah. Wait, how do you know that we know Micah's working with the Pinkertons now? Because oh, after, we don't. We don't know you, at this point in time. No, you know at the end. Uh, what the fuck is the word? Retroactively, I guess. Because like, uh, when you are saving Abigail and Sadie, um, Milton's like yo dog. It's, Milton, it's been right? Micah. Yeah, yeah. He's like yeah. Um, oh god, I just forgot her name. Even though I just said it. Molly. Molly. Yeah, she she sweated a few times, but she didn't tell us anything, so we had to let her go. But Mike has been a very good boy, and we picked him up after you guys got out of the uh, Caribbean. Yeah. But obviously, you don't know that until... You don't like, know that at this time the in the very game, end. but you know yeah. it later, yeah. Um, I love that this point in the story is when Molly... Not Molly, sorry. Sadie really starts to come into her own and become a much more powerful I character. I fucking love Sadie. Oh, she's she's so one of my faves, and I'm so glad that she exists. Now, I've seen other critiques online saying that they think Sadie is a little too over the top and that she's too, like, women's lib and... She's too oh, like, I'm going to shoot my own gun and take care of myself and wear pants all the time. And I'm like, no, I love that about her. I think it's badass that she's like, I'm going to be a better gunslinger than anybody else in this gang because I yeah. can be. Yep. I was talking to John about it and I was like, I would really love to see more of the dynamic between Sadie and her late husband and see really like what that home life was like because she's got – a lot of spitfire and I love that about her and I'm just in my mind during that time period it was really frowned upon for women to have a voice and she clearly couldn't have remained silent nobody with that much fire inside them can just no. like be a docile like 
home wife, right? Well, she even said in a conversation that her and her husband split all the duties split equally. Split the work, yeah. Right. Exactly. Oh, I loved her. And I loved that scene when Cuomo Driscoll is finally getting hanged. And he realizes that he's not going to be saved. And because he thinks his boys are going to save him. And then he looks and he sees Sadie and Dutch in the crowd with his boys with the knives to their neck. And then he looks up and Arthur waves from the rooftop. And he just starts The wave breathing. was really cute. Oh, yeah. And he just starts like, <laughs> holy shit. I thought that was such a good scene because you can just see the panic sink into his eyes. And then uh, he hangs. And then Sadie's like, you ruined my life. And then she cuts the neck. And then she shoots the other guy. And everyone's like, holy shit. That was so good. Oh, my God. I loved her. I'm glad she survived. Artie yeah. Era. Me Me too. Um, so this, of course, is at this moment uh, after they rescue John from the prison because um, Dutch is like, I'm not going after him. And I think that this is really where you get to see where how Dutch is kind of tur- starting to turn on his on his, the members of the gang that is supporting him, um, where he refuses to go and get John because he's like, oh, the the attention's too hot it's too risky we can't do it and then sadie's like fuck that we're gonna go get him it's john we have to go yeah. get him you know and abigail wants to go too and then arthur's like no no you stay here with jack like jack can't lose two parents let me and sadie go get him they go and get him of course um and then um, i love that hot air balloon part where you're scouting. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. And then the guy dies. And I think Arthur says, I, think, I really like that fella or something. Yeah, he's he was like, damn it. I liked that guy. He was funny. Yeah, that um, was a bummer. We kind of alluded to it briefly, but we never really discussed Arthur's infliction. Oh, oh no, right. th- no, that's so that's what we're uh, I was just about Are to get coming to up on that. I kind of forgot exactly where. Yeah. It so this is the point the of the st- this is the point of the story where um you we get to where you had that random collapse right like it just kind of you're going to meet city in a bar and then instead well, before you get there you fall right and, and you're then just you having have to a get to a doctor fit. and then you discover that you're sick and you're not just sick you have a terminal disease called tuberculosis My who problem. else raise your hand if you googled tuberculosis <laughs> i mean i knew what tuberculosis was but i didn't realize i mean obviously this is this was a very long I time have, ago. I have a... Oh, sorry, go ahead. But I, I, w- I think I told you this, Brittany, too. And I was like, when when they said he had tuberculosis, I was like, so what? Give him some medicine. Yeah, girl, <laughs> it's 1899. In my mind, I'm thinking, isn't tuberculosis curable? And I'm like, fuck, I guess it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so obviously, so before this happens, there is a scene where you see Arthur coughing. And yeah. I think we've all played enough games where like you don't really see stuff in games like that in a cut scene unless it serves a purpose. And so that kind of like raised my red flag a little bit, but I didn't think too much of it. And I didn't think about it actually until you see him collapse and then he's diagnosed with TB and then I Google it. I'm like, oh, but the problem I had with this is when you look at diseases in your menu, it says something along the lines of diseases are difficult to treat. And I'm like, okay, so maybe this is something I, I didn't know that this was a terminal disease that was ultimately going to kill me. And I feel like if they had removed that diseases are difficult to treat thing and it was just like mentioned in the story and the cutscenes that you have TB, it would have been, I would have thought like, okay, this is something that is going to kill me in the end. I, I, cause I always struggled. Like, is this something I'm going to be able to cure as I progress in the story? Or is this something that is just totally going to fucking kill me? No. Well, so and the there's minute- that one moment with the tribe where they hint at a cure yeah. for it. And he then you're like, hints oh. at a cure. he says, I can help you basically like manage it. Which is not the same thing as a it's, cure. It's hinted. No, I think it's hinted a little bit at the beginning. Like, this could be a fix. And then the more he talks, the more he explains, it's like, oh, this is not going to be a fix. So the minute that you fall down in the in the streets of saint and you get dragged to the doctor and he's like, it ain't good. That's the moment when I knew immediately Arthur is dead and I'm going to play as John after this. I just, I was like, okay. because And I knew that only because I had played Red Dead Redemption, and that was kind of the whole shtick, right? Like, you play through John, uh, play through as John the whole game, and then you fucking die, and then your son picks up the mantle, and you play as Jack. So, I, I that's, didn't, that's the first time I had, I, I was like, oh, I think that's where this that's is going. That's because you're so damn smart, Simer. But for me, I feel like the disease was almost game gamified, 
because it was in like your status section. It said you have TB, which makes me feel like there could be other diseases in that section that maybe I would contract <laughs> later. I, d- I didn't think like it was some, I don't know. That was no, the problem I knew. I had. I didn't know. I was like, this looks like something that you could get cured. It says diseases are hard to treat. I'm like, maybe I'll be able to treat it. But no, nay. So Fuck this me. is the turning point that to me really negatively impacted my gameplay experience. And it's not lost on me that Rockstar is clearly trying to say something by impacting a lot of the gameplay systems by making you terminally ill. I think clearly they're trying to drive home this overall narrative message of terminal illness affects everything in your life and will forever affect everything in your life in a negative way. But from a gameplay perspective, that fucking sucks, man. That's yeah. not fun. And the, uh, video games are not supposed to be dreary, sad, depressing experiences. Wow. And unless they're specifically unless designed to be Redemption. a piece of art that says that thing. And like in Red Dead Redemption, I was just like, in Red Dead Redemption 2, I was just like, why did you do this to me? Or if, uh, if not the very least, why couldn't have I gotten at least some kind of subtle hint from one of the characters or something narratively that was like, hey, maybe before you go and rescue John, we should take care of some of those other things, those other things you got, those other obligations. Somebody somewhere along the line giving me some But kind how the of hell would they hint. know you had tuberculosis? No, you it's don't. not. It's, it's not a hint. No, that's not the I point, know what Steimer. you're saying, I'm Andrea. I'm talking about figuring out some kind of gameplay mechanic to indicate to the player that a dramatic narrative event is going to happen. Listen, Bioware does it in fucking all of their games, right? Like, they figure out a way to tell you, yo, shit's going to go down when you do this mission. You maybe want to go finish your other stuff first before you go do this mission. Other games have done it too. And I think that's the thing that really frustrated me because from there on out, once, once Arthur is sick... It fundamentally changes the gameplay because you start to lose weight, which affects your stamina and your health. You can't get the same benefits from the food and the drinks that you buy and that you use, both in combat and the open world. That overall affects the gameplay experience to me in an incredibly negative way that impacted me so much that it makes me not like that choice. Even though narratively, I think it provides some really interesting ideas to the overall arc of not only Arthur but the other characters around him I just got so upset that that one choice had to impact gameplay in such a realistic way yeah and I think that's the part that I I struggle I think this is my biggest complaint with this game is again it felt so gamified that you couldn't even eat food without getting sick and I feel like there was another Steimer is just too smart for all of us she knew when as soon as he was diagnosed with TB I mean maybe even Andrea knew I'm not trying to discount your intelligence Andrea thank you but again I thought it was like a game thing and I feel like the way to convey that this is something that's going to kill you would have been like you said he said it's not good but maybe you have x amount of months left there's no cure i'm sorry but then don't impact the gameplay because how many people know that just because you have tb you can't eat certain food and you i don't know it just seemed kind of out of touch and that sucked and i was very upset about it It wasn't until like toward the very end where he starts going fucking pale and you see all of his veins and shit then i'm like okay he's actually gonna and die he's from coughing this. all the time and i'm just trying to get my dead eye core back up by smoking some cigarettes and then you smoke <laughs> the cigarettes smoke some cigarettes like, you have a <laughs> degenerative <laughs> lung disease go ahead and smoke well listen pack. it's either that or i get drunk before i go into a fight it's just like both are bad for you when you're terminally ill i just I think that <laughs> the pro and w- this comes back to one of the major issues I had with this game, despite the brilliant strokes of genius that are in the game making that is Red Dead Redemption Two. I think they committed so hard to the realism of only certain specific aspects of the game and not others, and then they committed so hard that they got in the way of their own ego that they took the fun out for players because there's a lot of photorealism in this game, not just from a graphical perspective, but like from the mechanical perspective, right? If you think about the way the guns fire, the way the horse trots, the way the carriages work, like a lot of the actual like like nuts and bolts of the game feel like they're based in this idea of it being more simulator than than fantasy, right? Us talking in the last segment about the difference in the horse butts between Assassin's Creed and Red Dead. 
getting in and out of the saddle in Red Dead is one of the most authentic feeling experiences I've ever had in a video game. The weight of it, the grit of it, the sound of it. I almost feel like I can smell the leather of the saddle. They've done such a great job of projecting the realism of that. But at the cost is that I still live in a world where I can take a, po a potion literally called Miracle Tonic where it fills up my health and my stamina and this weird magical supernatural ability I have to slow down time and headshot four guys in a row. But then because I'm sick with tuberculosis, I can't eat an apple and have it fill my health all the way. And I'm like, there's a dissonance here that takes that kind of sucks the fun of the experience right out. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to grapple with that. Yeah, I think Arthur getting sick narratively makes sense. I don't agree with the impact to gameplay that that introduced. And I think that's kind of, for me personally, where it comes to. And as for all the realism, it, it's kind of hard. I think everyone has a certain threshold because we all know we're playing a video game. You can get shot multiple times and walk away and it's fine and we accept that. But there are certain things that I think when you see in Rockstar, in this Rockstar game where certain things are so realistic, we're like, oh, that's really realistic. And it kind of like piques your interest because you're focusing on it. But then other things happen that aren't realistic and you don't think about it because you're so used to it. I think it's just kind of trying to tune your meter, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And it was funny because... I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Steimer. No, it's okay. Um, I, I find it interesting that you guys struggled with it so much. I mean, I definitely got sick a few times. I was like, oh, that's annoying. But for the most part... I didn't mind and I actually thought it was really an interesting choice to try and, and get through. I obviously, I, I think there's a few, there's several things in the game where I would have maybe tweaked the execution of it. But I think overall, I have just, I just kind of wrote some notes down of like how I felt emotionally about the game in general. And I think Red Dead Redemption, both of them are just about, essentially they are the tragedy of human nature in general. And part of the tragedy of human nature is we're fragile. We're all extremely fragile. We die fairly easily. We're flesh um, bags. What? We're flesh bags. <laughs> we are flesh bags. And especially in this time, we die very easily. We, we die a little bit less easily now. But <laughs> we're, we have a little bit more fortitude. But um, so I, I just thought it was interesting the way they... And like, yeah, it's it's upsetting. And it's upsetting to see him, especially when you... When he starts to look it, when he when his face gets stainy and you, that's the most upsetting because I love the customization of the clothing and I hate that I look so pretty in my clothes, but then Arthur looks so fucking bad. <laughs> he's he's sick, all gone. Andrea. He's got weird patches on his face. His eyes are all bloodshot. I'm like, that's oh, when I started God. growing a full beard. I was like, you know what? You can have the beard because my have God, the beard. seriously, like, it covers up his face. Yeah, I mean, I feel so bad, but like, and, but that, I mean, I think they, they had to do it in that sense in order for this to make any sort of narrative or emotional impact. Because if he was just running around doing the same shit, you wouldn't feel it when he starts to make the choices that he does because he's feeling his mortality. You're right. And you wouldn't believe him when he's starting to be like, you know what? I don't know that I've lived a good life. That's I don't know that I, I don't know that I ch chose correctly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're so right, Steimer. I 100% I agree that in order for them to make it impactful, they had to do it. This is why I just wanted some kind of indicator that this major event was going to, was about to fundamentally place. change the way the entire game plays. Because I would have gone to do a lot of those other side quests before Arthur gets like, dramatically ill and then can no longer perform to the same level that he was performing to before and also like visually it's going to be different he's going to be coughing all the time like the way he interacts with people is going to be different that's I think that's like my one like if Rockstar could do something differently like I mean obviously there's more things but um if I could pick like one thing for them to change it would be that and that's why I tell people now without trying to spoil it I just say hey, like something big fucking happens in the game that's going to change the way the game plays. So do all your side quests early, like as often as you can before you get to chapter four or three, really before chapter three, I would recommend doing as much as you can. But 
once you get to Saint Denis, like don't finish the Saint Denis quest lines before you <laughs> before you do everything. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on this because you know we have a, a lot more to go. A lot more to go. Yes. Um, so obviously Arthur gets sick, um, and it's going to affect the rest of the game. And then this is where um, we go to. Where am I at here? Um, is this where the, this is where the Native American tribe really comes into play. So yeah. you have some quest lines with Rains Falls and Eagle Flies. Eagle Flies. Um, two of the members of the tribe that's in the game. Of course, Charles is a Native American member of the gang. And you, he is a key member of these quest lines. And He's uh, also one of my favorites. He and Sadie I were my favorites. Charles. Yeah. So he's I was wonderful. super stoked that they actually <laughs> made it to the end. Yeah. I was like, exactly. Thank <laughs> God. So I was I actually like, uh, I also texted this to you, Britt. I was like, it's incredible to me that like the, the last trio riding in on essentially the last real mission is a woman, a black slash Afri- or black slash Native, Native American. American and then you is well then your white boy John Marston. But like yeah. I was like, that's cool that they have like a this 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 these are the people I wanted really at the end with me. So I'm glad that it was them. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, sorry, it, it, cool, I think the whole storyline is great. I think it reminds people who have conveniently forgot how America came to be. And I like that we live in an era where Many states have chosen to no longer celebrate Columbus Day because of what that represents. And to remember that the Native Americans that were here, like, were here before the United States was a country. And it's really easy to forget because I remember growing up and being told a very different version of history. I I don't think that I was ever lied to in the schools that I went to, but I think a lot was conveniently left out. Um, Mm, Sure. And not to say that, you know, like I'm not a teacher. I'm not an educator. I don't know when is the right time to tell kids about like the grotesque things that happened to make the United States become the country that it is today. But I think it's important and great that a company like Rockstar is like, hey, you know what? We're not going to shy away from this. We're going to lean in and talk about it. And it's obviously not as I don't want to overstate it, right? Like it's not like they're making some big, huge social statement on Native American culture and its place in United States history. But my point here is that I'm glad that they included it. Yes, and I also think it's interesting how I mean they not only included it as like a as you guys being observers from the gang, Dutch, then of course, motherfucking Dutch. Yep, uh, fucking Dutch has to. Has to get his hand in the pot, right? Just can't leave it alone. He has to and I think create it's interesting. noise. He has to create noise. So not only are the poor Native Americans being dicked around by the United States government, now they got Dutch Vanderland coming over and trying to use them for his own, as a distraction, basically, in order to try and buy the gang some time, theoretically. Again, I think Dutch is fucking bonkers. But um, that's the quote-unquote plan is we will make the government continue to fight the native Americans and then we'll we'll slip away because they'll be distracted, which is garbage. And I hate you, Dutch, but I kind of had that holy, like that holy shit moment when we're killing members of the U S army. I'm like, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Where these outlaws. Not only that, he's, you know, he's just, he's basically riding a frenzied horse and kicking it. Right. He's just like, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you're like, no, <laughs> stop. Calm the horse down. It's like, Jesus. So I felt I felt so bad for Rain's Fall and like just watching. Wait, yes, that's the that's the chief one. Um, yeah, his son and, is Eagle Flies. And the son is Eagle Flies and like go, going through the whole story where, uh, you know, he 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 loses the one thing he didn't want to lose, which is his son. And. It's just it's fucking heartbreaking. heartbreaking to yeah, see and it's like, that and it's like for what this is i think the the that whole storyline with rains falls is really where i started to hate dutch as a character because yes. i think in the beginning i kind of 
was on board for his swagger and his ability to kind of like throw his weight around and be like, I'm the leader of this gang and it's a gang and we're going to commit these crimes and we're badass. And I was like, yeah, I'm on board. And then it was when he started to like portray this false sense of superiority because like there was certainly hints in Dutch's arc at the beginning of him having a code right having some kind of weird morality that they all adhered to and they would do things that were illegal but not bad things to 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 good people they would only do bad mm-hmm. things to bad people or to the government they would or, Robin Hood it kind of but not kind of yeah like a just weird for version of Robin Hood yeah and this is the moment where I was like you know what Fuck you. You're a <laughs> badass dude. And I don't mean badass and cool. I mean like bad as in like rotten like to the rotten core. Like rotten to the core. Yes. See, we were thinking of the same thing. Yeah, we were. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like. But, uh, but I think this kind of, I again, like the notes that the general themes um, that I've kind of like pulled away from this. And this is one of those arcs that really showcases it is just how. We are tragically driven more by emotion than anything else. Logic does not drive us as humans. Emotion does. And that's why Eagle Flies does what he does. And it's why he ultimately dies. Um, and it, it's why Arthur dies in a, in a way. Um, and it's why John dies. And it's like why most of these fucking people die. And you're just like, ah, could you all just not? Could you sit down? Could you read a book? Could you have some tea? Just <laughs> chill for a second <laughs> read a book and watch <laughs> <laughs> like it's because uh, i'll and i have further notes but we'll get there in a minute because we're we're still there but i think that this is this is definitely one of those things where like that's exactly what's happening here and there's really nothing anyone can do and there's even a point where you as john or no sorry you as arthur are talking to eagle flies before he's dying as he's dying and you're like i'm sorry i believe I believe like Dutch manipulated you. And he says, we're all grown men here. No one told us to do anything. We all made these choices on our own. Boom. And I was like, yeah, I mean, you did. You, it, it's weird to be like, yes, I am irrationally. I am acting irrationally in a way, but still have self-awareness of what I'm doing and know that even though this is, purely rage driven and probably futile I'm doing it like I'm just making this choice to essentially die for what I believe is a cause but ultimately is not quite a cause yeah and that's I, it's one of those things where I'm like can't relate I don't know what that's like I don't know what it's like to ever feel something that that strongly to be like I want to die for that mm. I don't know that I ever will. I hope I don't. (laughs) I really don't want to go out that way. I think the whole idea of 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 conflict and battle and wartime in that era was so different than it is today because we just inherently don't have those face to face physical conflicts in the same way that they did back then, right? Like if you have a fight or a dispute with your neighbor, you usually settle it in court or through the police or through some other kind of mediator. It's not like you're bringing your shotgun over to your neighbor's house and being like, get your dog off my lawn. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, it's it's just a different, it's a different time and a different uh, stake, I think, in human life. And I think we just as a society are more enlightened in what human life, the value of human life is than they were then. I don't want to say that we as a species have lost honor overall, but I kind of feel like we have in a certain way. I feel like a lot of it is like the stakes just seem much lower now than they were before because we feel that we can be a little bit more invincible in a certain way, if that makes sense. Like I think about, I'm not, I'm not trying to go down a deep philosophical road right now because we, we have my beard. You got me thinking we have a little bit more to discuss here, but I, I think what's great about something like what you said, Steimer is that it makes you think about where we're at today. And like, I don't have things in my immediate life 
that I would put my life on the line for outside of, you know, my family, right? You know, and my close friends. But like, I don't think that there will ever be a situation where I'm going to be forced to put my life on the line for you, right? Like, I don't right. think that somebody's going to start a war or a battle or bring a gun somewhere where I'm going to have to like put my life out there at risk. And that's not something that we here in the United States have to deal with. Now, I'm not speaking for people in other countries that live in different situations than than I have. I'm just speaking mu purely from my own. And that's way different than it was even 200 years ago, right? Like my chances of dying were much higher <laughs> two, two centuries yeah. ago than they are today. Yeah, I think there was even um, a losing of, I fucking forget which part of the game it was, but a ba basically like you're just at home at the wrong time. Oh, when Arthur finally reveals he had a son. Oh, that's and he's right. riding with he's riding with uh, Rainsfall, and he's talking about you know I had a son, and I and the lady who had her, he basically knocked up a a bar woman, and they and he used to go visit them, and he had a relationship with her and his son, and one day people came robbing and just killed the both of them for no for for nothing like they didn't have any money, so I think that that's kind of a an, an Another additional illustration of that, that living in that time period, it was, People you didn't died live and no very one long. People really died really cared. You didn't know. Yeah. It was like, oh, someone was just killed randomly, sad day. Like, that was it. But, God, yeah, sorry to go back to Arthur. Yeah, so how did you ladies feel about that um, family, that, that the, the, you know, the news that he had a son and he had a, a woman before, what's your butt? Oh, my God. Can we talk about what's her butt for a minute? What's yeah. her butt? What is her name? <laughs> is it Mary Beth or something? No, Mary Beth is one of the people in the No, camp, not Mary she? Beth, but her name was Mary or some shit. It has, it was in the Mary? M. Wasn't it just Mary? I don't fucking remember. She was dumb. I did not like her at all. I really wanted Arthur and Yeah, Sadie her name's Mary. Together. Her name's Mary Linton. Mary and she Linton. Sucks. Yeah, that's her name. I hated Mary Linton. Mary Linton, go away. Um, Stop asking your ex boyfriend <laughs> for favors. <laughs> yeah, I, quite frankly, did not remember the conversation about Arthur's woman that he knocked up and him having a son. Got to be totally honest. Oh. Did not remember right, that happened. Enough. Did not remember okay. Arthur had a kid that got murdered. Did not know. This is news to me. You guys bringing it up. <laughs> there you go. Right now. Well, um, he did. <laughs> um, but Mary's storyline, I was kind of holding out hope in the back of my mind that Arthur would take her up and, you know, go meet her eventually. And... The final scene with John and Abigail in the boat at the very end, I thought was Arthur and Mary. I just, I think I must have been either like distracted or drunk or both when John was playing <laughs> through that scene. Cause I remember looking over and seeing him propose and I was like, oh, that's cute. In the end of the game, Arthur finally proposes to Mary and John's like, Arthur's no. dead. Yeah. And John's like, no, that's, no, that's no. not. No. <laughs> what that's a what, happy ending. A happy I know. That's what we wanted. To, I wanted to be in that timeline. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. If only. If only. Um, to, I was like, maybe it's a dream sequence. And John's like, no, no. Um, no, no. That's John Marston wearing Arthur's hat. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Arthur. Brett. Yeah, so go back to Arthur. So the woman was, yeah, a young waitress named Eliza. And she was pregnant with her son, Isaac. She knew who he was, but he accepted whatever support but accepted whatever support Arthur offered to her and their son. Arthur would visit Eliza and Isaac every few months and stay with them for days at a time. One day, Arthur arrived at their home and saw two crosses outside and knew immediately that they were both dead and later learned that they were both killed by robbers, all for $10. The incident hardened Arthur ever since, and he never truly coped with the pain. It's fucking dark. And, like, that's the the fact that the first time he really matches it is with um, Rain's Falls, and that's, fuck, like, almost, the game's almost over at that yeah. point. Yeah. Like that, I think, illustrates that too. Just like this guy's had a weird, weird life. And he never copes with any of and that, he, which is hard for a human to go through. But yeah, back to Mary. She, what I was hoping would happen is that Arthur would be like, listen, you're too meh for me. I'm going to go bang Sadie and we're going to go have an awesome romantic relationship because I think those two would be hilarious together. They'd be never great. happened. Instead, Mary breaks Arthur's heart, or I guess she he broke her heart, too. And then she sends this ring back, and that's what John uses to propose to Abigail. And all of the feelings 
So no. tragic. Oh. I also really hated the way she said Arthur. I'm just going to be real. Oh, Arthur. Uh, Arthur. And I'm like, I hate, I just stopped talking. She said, oh, too much. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Uh, yeah. I just didn't see her and Arthur being compatible, which made that relationship really hard to believe. To believe. Yeah. 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 I agree. I, I didn't, I didn't quite buy it. I can, I definitely could see him having a, a love that wouldn't work out for similar reasons. But it was just something about her personality and the way she spoke and the way she was where I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't see. How did you? How? I don't know. Oh, Maybe for it me, it doesn't make sense. A Definitely an opposites attract situation. But yeah, a purposely flawed relationship where it was never going to work. But still, I think it would have been fun to have a explored something else that would have been a little more entertaining. But it would have been nice for Arthur to like have something nice in his fucking life. Jesus sad day i know poor so man tragic Ugh. yeah um so this is getting a little on the long side so i think we're gonna have to kind of like speed our way to the let's end go to the end because the, the end is the most important part so let me just like quickly recap what we're gonna speed over of course we've got um the gang um collapsing um arthur heads back to can to confront bell um talking about bell Micah. Micah, Micah Bell. Bell. Yeah. Tells the women to leave for safety, bidding them farewell. The gang collapses on Arthur when John returned to camp, openly accusing Micah and Dutch of betrayal. Dutch, Williamson, and um, so Dutch, Bill, and Javier, and Micah turn on John and Arthur when the Pinkertons arrive, but all manage to flee into the wilderness. Arthur accepts his fate and either buys John time to escape by confronting the Pinkertons or heads back to camp to retrieve Dutch, Dutch's money stash. So... This is like the very, very final end of the game. Um, you missed one part, and the only reason I'm going to bring it up is because it comes into play later, and that is the, in between those things, but in between the Native Americans and this, um, there was a final quote-unquote train heist supposed to go down. Yes. And the train heist, during the train heist, John gets shot and essentially left for dead. Right. So he, get, he gets shot. Like, you as Arthur. I'm going to go back for John. <laughs> Dutch says I'm going to go back for John comes back later to the camp right before the Pinkertons get there and says John's dead he he didn't make it lying liar um, which is a bold faced lie yeah so they all ride into town and then there's just one moment that was really emotional for me and I even teared up a little bit watching it again today it was when they all come back after the failed heist or the heist in general and Tilly and Jack are on their horse and they're like oh my god Abigail's gone and Dutch is hemming and hawing. Do we go after her? Do we go after her? And Micah's like, she's just a girl. It's not worth it. And Dutch is like, no, yeah, you're right, Micah. It's not worth it. And Marston's like, what are you talking about? And they're like, sorry, LOL. They write off. And then it's just Sadie and Arthur. And Arthur then gives Tilly all of this money. And he's like, you live a good life and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, thank you. And she says, I'll, I'll miss. And then he goes, me too, sweetheart. And then off they go. And oh my God, it is just so sad. Is that Something your most that. emotionally devastating moment that you couldn't talk about in our no, What's Good Game Awards? That, <laughs> no, I think that was still Arthur Morgan dying for me. Yeah. But, um, there is that. And then obviously when Arthur is confronting everyone, Susan gets shot by Micah and then she dies and rides oh, on the Oh, that was Miss Pearson. I was, was it Miss Pearson? No. What's her name? Miss Pearson shoots Molly. Yeah, no, yeah. So and it then, is Miss and Pearson, then, and then she also dies Micah later. Micah shoots right? her. Yeah, I yeah, was Michael just like, her. I that fucking like, I was so sad. I was like, she didn't deserve to get shot like that. Fucking Micah. I know, because she was distracted <sighs> because someone's running up. It's like, oh, the Pinkertons are coming, and then she looks, and then he shoots her in the gut, and then she yep. just like suffers, and then Dutch does not say a goddamn word at all after that happens. He doesn't even acknowledge it. And before she was the glue, you know, that kept everything functioning. Like, hey, you clean yep. this up, get to work. Oh, my God. Packing All up of the camp glue every was time coming Dutch unhinged. wants to move everybody. And Yeah, it was her job. And that fucking asshole. Um, also, one other death that really fucked me up was Kieran Duffy. When the O'Driscolls get Ooh, him. Ooh, when they sent back on his head? They send him back on the horse. He's holding his head. He's beheaded, but his hands are holding his head and his it's eyes so are It's so fucking gross. Out. And then he just trots up. Oh, God. Blech. Anyway. Disgusting. Ooh, that's all. Anyways. Yes. No, I. Yeah. There were a lot of very unsettling deaths in this game. Oh, no, no. Miss um, Grimshaw. Susan Grimshaw. Grimshaw. Guys, Pearson. That's her name. Oh, shit. You're right. Yeah, because yeah. Pearson's the butcher. Pretty sure the Pearson's he, the butcher. Yeah. Yeah. He opens up his own little shop later on. Good for him. 
I know, but that it was so weird. I was like, why would you put a picture of you with like America's most wanted essentially they're all up dead, in your shop? Matter. They're not all dead. They're, they're looking boys. for them. What? But anyways, um, so I want to talk about the ending ending. And yeah. I know, Andrea, you'd said um, that you hadn't necessarily watched because there are technically multiple endings here. Yes. So we get to the we get to the end. Right. So you go through this fight. Um, you're with Marston and you get to make the big choice at the end. Do you go back for Dutch's money or do you help John escape? I think that there's universally only one right choice here and it's to help John escape. Did yes. either of you pick something else? No. Oh, no. Like with everything that happens with Arthur's arc and like in the show notes, I wrote down um, some... Some things from, so the gamer.com did an article called 25 Plot Holes on in, in Red Dead Redemption 2. And they wrote that narratively, there's no, there's simply no realistic way that Arthur would have had low honor at the end of the game. He's actively giving away money. And the reason that they say that, they say during the final mission, Arthur will have the choice between helping John escape and doing and going back for Dutch's money. And they say just contextually, which choice do you think Arthur would make? Would he help John, a character who he has spent all game helping, escape and fight for a better life? Or would he go back to find money that he never once in the entire game made an explicit mention of desiring? Yeah. I think that that's like a really like hits the nail on the head. And like, of course, help John escape. But I don't know. Steinberg. I mean, I feel like that choice didn't need to be there. I don't know why it was there. It was dumb. Um, yeah. Agreed. But, yeah. I think it was just in case you were trying, because obviously this game is called Red Dead Redemption. So of course it's going to push Arthur Morgan having redemption and trying to become a better person. But if you did play the entirety of the game, an asshole, then maybe like that gave you your asshole, you know, option out. Although if you watch that ending, you know, he still gives John his I think is his rifle and he gives him his hat and he's like basically good luck man and then he goes back so it's not even that bad of an ending if you are playing as low honor so like I understand what they're saying is that there's not really a, an like a dick dick dicky yeah I that. think I think what would have made more sense is if if Arthur had said you know what I'm gonna go back for the money to find it and, and give it to you John like I'm going to do this for you in some weird way but instead, he's just like, I got to go back for the money. And you're like, why? You're going to get killed or or you're going to die of tuberculosis in the cave. Like so, some way you're dying. Someone and had, so like yeah. no one's getting this money or are you just trying to make sure that they don't get it? Like it was it, I think they needed to clarify the motivation a little bit more behind so I it, was reading about it to this. make sense. And I, I saw a few comments and I don't I can't speak for myself, but he the theory was that he was going to get the money to try to go to California to cure his TB. Which oh. obviously by this point we know he's like on his way out. And I think he knows that too, which is why yeah. I kind of struggle accepting that. But I think that was the thought. I appreciate I you the internet had that TV. thought, but I say you're dumb. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't think, no. Anyways. Um, but when you go the correct route <laughs> and you help John uh, escape, God, this, the whole thing like just super fucked me up. Um, and so basically the only two alternate endings here, you still die. Um, but if you are high honor, you get to die the death Arthur talks about, where he's like, basically like, just sit me down and point me West watch the and sunrise. like and watch the sunrise. Mm -hmm. Uh, although yes, that's correct. I'm sorry. I was like, wait, is this? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, if you don't, and you're very low honor, fucking Micah kills you. Like, that's how you go out. In the um, head. Shoots you in the head. Shoots you in the head. <gasps> oh my God. I'm so glad I didn't get that. So did you, so in your ending, um, Dutch. I got the good ending. So Dutch shows up, right? So you're fighting yes, he Micah on both. this mountaintop. So John escapes. You fight yes. off the, the, all of the agents that are coming in. You shoot a bunch of people who are just trying to do their job. Um, <laughs> and you help John escape. And yep. then Micah comes up the mountaintop and you get into like a fist fight with him. And yes. in that fist fight, you eventually pull out your gun and then your gun gets kicked away. And then you're crawling, like beaten up. And Micah's taunting you like, you're never going to get there. Because you're like I'm gonna heavy you. breathing. And he's like fucking saying all this bullshit. And then you get to your gun, you grab it. And then Dutch comes in and puts his foot on your hand as you're mm -hmm. picking up the gun. And 
that's when like Dutch really true shows his true colors as a villain versus a hero in this story or a leader. And at the end of it all, like I for a half a second, I thought the Dutch was going to shoot Micah uh. and then he doesn't. And then Micah runs away and Dutch runs away and your Arthur is just there by himself yeah. on the mountaintop so- about to die. Also, I don't know if we said the sun rises in, in the west. It is not. It is the east. Anyway, that's so what yeah. I was. That's the part that I had paused at. I was like, is that correct? Because I, I was like, I was thinking back. directionally. I'm like, I don't think it sets <laughs> yeah. rises in the west. <laughs> so rises Andrea, in the east. So low honor plays out the same way, except for Dutch leaves. And then Micah, instead of turning around and leaving, he comes back to Arthur and he says some stuff. I think he says, damn you. And Arthur says, damn us all. And then he shoots him in the head. And then he obviously ties and then it turns to the um, Unshaken song starts playing. But instead of seeing the buck, you see a wolf. And the wolf retreats into a cave. And that's if only if you have low honor. Mm, interesting. Yeah, if you have low honor, the wolf is your symbol. Yeah. I think it's it's to symbolize like you are just a lone wolf in this also, area. Also, I want to know, where does Dutch go? Because he turns around and he walks toward where up Arthur Up the mountain. Him. Yeah, he, he like walks toward where Arthur dies. And then I came back as I was playing as Marston and revisited that area. And the only thing I saw there was an eagle. I was hoping for like something. But there's like no other way off of that mountain. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, like what happened? That was him? video game magic one of, for you. Yeah, one also of wearing, many suspensions of disbeliefs uh, needed so to believe yeah. the events and that He's not wearing in, rock in climbing Dead. shoes. Okay, yeah. so He's anyway, wearing slippery shoes. This happens. I was a blubbering mess because Unshaken is such an emotional song and it plays after you get off of Guarda and you're coming back to your camp to find everyone gone. And then I was just like, oh, no, they fucking killed him. I mean, I knew they were going to, but just seeing him take that last breath or exhaling finally. And then the song like really kicks in and it's like, no. And they so put, kick you right to Marston. And I was not ready. I knew no, like a mourning period. Thank you. I feel like they fucking glossed over Arthur's death in the most grotesque way. I'm like, here is the hero of this story. He's literally on a redemption narrative arc. And he has this death that feels so brief. It's like they don't spend enough time building to it. And then after they don't spend enough time letting it like sit with you and resonate with you as a player. They immediately dump you into the fucking epilogue which by the way we're gonna talk about how much i hate this fucking epilogue um and (gasps) then i'm just like no this is my guy i've been building this character this entire game and i knew that he was gonna die the moment he got tuberculosis i knew that it was the end of arthur at some point but then that end comes and i wanted it to have more narrative and gameplay impact than it did i was so disappointed in how they handled it i was not but I think that's because, again, I knew what was happening. And also, I fucking love John. And I was kind of like, oh, my God, my baby boy, John. John is back to me. I am so grateful to have him again. Thank you, Rockstar. You have blessed me. <laughs> but the, but in a, like the worst possible way, because yeah. then, of course, you know how John ends, too. So it's not so it's tragic. like a very weird, tragic, brief reunion with someone before they go off to die. There's nothing to look forward to when you're playing that because you know what's all going to happen. It's so upsetting. And then so like there's and there's so many small things. So basically the epilogue, which uh, mm-hmm. is fairly long. And I think, again, like if you didn't hours, play Red Dead. Re- way too fucking long, Rockstar. I if know you you're listening. If you didn't play Red Dead Redemption, <laughs> will not have nearly the emotional impact on you that it will if you did. Because if you did, you have, number one, that connection to John Marston that is much deeper than if you've played just Red Dead Redemption 2. Because that's not what Red Dead Redemption 2 was trying to do, right? It's building you with Arthur Morgan. So you to get John back, and first off, I love how different their bodies are. This is a minor thing, but I really liked how like kind of scrawny he is, and like he's definitely not Arthur. Arthur's built like a tank. And and I, I like liked looking in the menu. It's like his weight's perfect. I'm like, is it? He's a little <laughs> scrawny. Um but so you play through as John and Abigail trying to build this life that Arthur basically sacrificed his life so John and Abigail could go off and find happiness and not live this way anymore. Obviously, John and Abigail, even throughout Red Dead Redemption, have fights about um, John's Everything. behavior because he John keeps 
relapsing sort of back into his old habits of gunslinger days. And she's like, no, man, you got to cut that shit out. Like, <laughs> which she's not wrong. Um, I think basically you just kind of go through the whole thing where you, where you, it shows you how you come to Beecher's hope. It shows you how you get your farm. It shows you how uncle comes to be there. Charles comes um, and helps you for a while. And this was the part that I, I honestly was just sitting there crying because you are building your grave. That's what's happening. And it's like, it's just deeply upsetting, especially you build the house and like, that's where your last memories will be. And then Charles builds this barn, which is where you die. And a lot of the times when you're doing these missions, it spawns you up on the top of your hill. And that's where your grave is. Like you are standing there on your gravesite, and your wife's going to be there next to you eventually. And it's just fucking sad. Like the whole thing is sad. And like, it makes me tear up thinking about it right now because all you want is happiness for these fucking people and they can't seem to get it. And this was so, okay. So the emotional uh, drama of not like people being emotionally driven and not logically driven. And this John at the very end of this epilogue goes after Micah. John, had he really been listening to Arthur and processed what Arthur was saying and did not act emotionally would not have gone after Arthur gone after Micah because Arthur would never have wanted him to Arthur was not a revenge driven person he often would tell Dutch he was being foolish when he was going after revenge missions and in fact the reason that John even gets found by the fucking Pinkertons is because he went after Micah and in sorry I kind of glossed over that part which is extremely important yeah (laughs) no, I'm glad that you brought it up because that's like the one saving grace of the epilogue for me is that amazing fight sequence in the mountain going to gun down Micah because we all know that we all want to fucking murder Micah through the face like many yes. times. Like you as a player want to murder Micah. You as uh, John wants to murder Micah. Um, because I asked, I asked by John, John Drake, um, while I was playing through Red Dead, I was like, spoil it for me. Tell me Micah fucking gets his. Because I'm rewatching Game of Thrones and I take some solace in the fact that Joffrey gets his at some point <laughs> in the series. I'm like, tell me. He's like, you sure you want to know? I go, yes. Tell me right now that this fucking terrible prick of a human being gets it. And he's like, yeah, he gets it. I'm like, okay, good. But I thought it came much earlier. I didn't realize it was at the very, very last thing of the game. But that fight, the music is oh. so fantastically done and if you don't remember watch a gameplay video of somebody on the internet doing it because it's so masterfully done and it's such a fantastic firefight and I was and I was not prepared for how intense that fight was going to be I'm like going up the hill eating every little fucking thing that's in my yep. inventory because I'm like dying and getting shot. I'm like, I need more dead eye. Like I use, a, it's like that RPG moment where you like are stocking up everything and then you just like wipe out your entire inventory through one single battle. And it was such a fitting end. And then fucking Dutch. Uh, fucking, I gasped out loud. Me too. When I, when Dutch came out because I, I don't, I don't know why I wasn't expecting him to. I think because I knew he's he's coming back later, so I wasn't sure if they'd bring him in here or not. Well, you don't um, know. And well, also, yeah. I wanted, like, I, I assume you knew this as well, Brittany, but I knew that Micah was going to be the very last mission we did in the epilogue because that's just the same sort of structure as Red Dead uh, was as well. Like, the last mission you do as Jack is killing Edgar Ross. I wasn't expecting Dutch... Because, I mean, maybe this info is out there and I don't know the timeline, but I was like, is he in Mexico yet? Is he recruiting his new gang? Like, what? where is Dutch? And then he stepped out and I too gasped. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, oh my God, you motherfucker. So, Um, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Obviously, Dutch ends up shooting Micah. And what I thought was interesting is if you notice the like the final ish words that Arthur says to uh, to Dutch is I gave you all I had. I did obviously through a very strained, dying and sick voice. And it's very, 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 very sad. And then John tells Dutch, Dutch, we did. We all did our best for you Ain't our fault. Things turned out the way they did. And I think after that point, there's little to no dialogue shared between them. And then Dutch shoots Micah. 
Now, I would like to think it's because Dutch maybe was like, shit, I'm getting deja vu. Arthur said something very similar to me when I was in a very similar situation with Micah, and here I am again. And then that's why he shot Micah. That's what I would like to believe, but I don't know. Maybe Micah was just too much of an inconvenience, causing too much problems. Maybe Dutch finally saw through it, and he's like, I'm in Mexico and starting my new gang. I don't know. I think, and I think I was, I was talking with you about this, Brittany, is I do think in a way he would have been more inclined to, Maybe maybe he was too far gone, too deep in it at that point with Arthur, but I also think Arthur's tuberculosis didn't help because to then Dutch looked at him and he was a lost cause. Mm -hmm. So why am I going to try and fight for you? You're going to die at like God knows when, but it's coming like you're yeah. sort of you're sort of a wash in my book. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, you but Arthur and John are both two of the most like sun like figures to right. Dutch. Especially John. Well, especially Arthur, I guess. But, you know, so I think I also think on a fundamental level, Dutch probably couldn't bear the loss of both of them. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, fuck, if it's Micah or John. Bye, Micah. Like, like this yeah. is a choice where John is alive. John is healthy. John has a chance. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur never did. So that's what I would like to think is going on on some level with Dutch, but God knows. And I was shocked when he shot him because yeah. I wasn't expecting it because I just thought that Dutch was so fucked up at that point that like there was no way to, and yeah. I, I, this did, did, did not redeem him, but he definitely, I was like, thank God. But I think, <laughs> I think also, I think we're on the right trail here because even after Arthur said, I gave you all I did, all I had, I did. Dutch stutters a little bit. And he says, I, I, and then he just kind of turns and walks away. Like he can't bring himself. He can't, he can't bear it because. Yeah. And so once upon a time, this was a while ago, but I read a book about con artists and how they work and how they are able to manipulate people. And the interesting part was that the more you thought you were immune to it, the more susceptible you were. And I think that's Dutch. So Dutch thinking he is God's gift to man is also a con artist managed to get conned because he didn't think it was possible. And I think both in Arthur's death and then when John is life's on the line, basically mm -hmm. that's, those are the moments where he's sort of shaken a little bit and is able to get perspective that, Holy shit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe something, maybe they were right. Maybe about some of the up? things they were saying, yeah. maybe I fucked up. Maybe I fucked up here. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he would ever think that necessarily, but maybe he would be like, Oh, maybe, you know, maybe Micah is bad. That's probably the extent of Mike is oh. probably. Yeah, probably Mike is bad for me. I should eliminate him. John's on a, not John's on a threat anymore. LOL. Little did he know. Yes. But yeah. No. Yes. I think and it was interesting to me. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. Um, Go ahead. Steimer. No, I'm going to move into a parallel between Arthur and John's death. So go ahead. The, I just wanted to briefly touch on the reason why I was upset about how the epilogue was handled was because that scene that whole sequence where you go after Micah with Sadie was so impactful that I was really upset that between the final scene of the main game where Arthur dies and Micah and um, Dutch escape, I was so upset that I had to go through the most mundane like missions to get to that ending. That's I think what made me mad and like, it's funny, I told John in the moment, I was like, I get that, I get Rockstar is trying to extend the gameplay experience for people and kind of give you this sense of normalcy, but I didn't want that. I was heated at the end of the game. I needed something else because I felt like Arthur's death was too brief and I needed something else to kind of like satiate this like narrative hole that I was feeling from the way that they handled the ending. And I think ultimately that final epilogue part two ending was really well done. And uh, I really en enjoyed the way that they played it out. And like I mentioned earlier with the music and the gunplay and everything, but the steps to get there were so infuriating in a way that's kind of difficult to describe, like literally shoveling shit into a barrel and building a fence 
and doing all these this bullshit and i'm just like why it's like the whole idea of guarma like why why did you have to do that like i get the idea of setting up like they have to set up the transition to john to set up how red dead redemption 2 is a prequel to red dead redemption right i get that and i think they did a really good job with it but they could have truncated that shit so much better and made it maybe like a two to three hour prologue instead of a 10 hour prologue or excuse me epilogue and so I'm just like, ugh, man, yeah. it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because I didn't mind it at all. Now, granted, I loved every part of this game. I liked the pace of it. I liked how slow it was. I liked how I could just take my time with it. And like we talked about, I think, in the second segment, I know you, Andrea, were like, it does some really great things, but it's just definitely not my 100% game of the year kind of game. It's a little too slow for me. And for me, I like that sim aspect when you see characters like John Marston. And this could be because I know it's coming in Red Dead Redemption, obviously, like the earlier game. But I'd be curious to know people who did not play Red Dead Redemption, if you were invested in the story and you did like the pace of it, how they did like this epilogue. Because I like the slowness of it, although it did take me a while to get used to to transition from Arthur's death to Marston because I was very, very sad and it was too fucking soon. I needed like a mourning period. But I did... I did enjoy the pace of it, and I think it showcased Marston trying to, like you said, better his life, and it showed him in certain circumstances where he had to show patience and show restraint. Maybe it did last a little long, but for me, it didn't feel like it because I was invested in every moment that was happening. Yep. But. I, yeah, I just think I, that there was just one too many bounty missions with Sadie, one too many chores to do around the farm. I think they could have, like emphasize what each of those things meant individually in a, a much ed more edited way. And I think that's where I really got upset. The one mission from the epilogue that I really thought was impactful and that I really enjoyed was where you go horse riding with Jack. I thought oh, that yeah. that was such a nice moment to have to see a different side of John as a father, to see him interact with his son, because you don't get to see that at all during the game. And as somebody who didn't play very much of Red Dead Redemption, I mean, like maybe like five hours worth, um, I don't, I never got to see what that relationship would become. And that moment, I thought was like the one saving grace of the epilogue for me, outside of the final mission where you kill Micah. But um, real question: Did you let Jack win, or did you win the race? I let him win. I let him win. I also let him win. No, we're good people. <laughs> I was mostly just like, you know what, kid? You're going to take up the mantle one day. You can feel good. Also, like, he's got such bad self-esteem. Go ahead. Yeah. Win. Yeah. We had a Build you up a little bit. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah. But so, you were saying, I'm sorry. No, no. That was it. I, I don't disagree. I think um, in general, the game could have done with a little bit more editing. In general, mm. most most creative works could. Uh, but I liked, I'd liked the things that we were doing, but yeah, maybe there was one to be cut a little bit of it. Snip down a little shit, bit. Build too many fences. Yes. The house uh, building song was weird, but also kind of funny. Which one? <laughs> Where you build the house to the song. That's all about oh, building oh, a house. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked that. I liked that a lot. Um, uh, the one thing real quick that we haven't talked about, I want to talk about real quick is the, your horse death. Oh, oh yeah. my fucking God. I, now, I that might have been for, more sad for me than Arthur's death. So what that? happened to me is I was so like in the moment, I'm like, oh my god, everything's happening. That my I saw my horse get shot, and then I just started running up the hill. So that cutscene I don't think ever triggered for me, where you have that final moment with your horse. Wait, you really? Just, I don't remember that because oh. I, I watched. I don't it. think it's possible to skip that. I it's don't not possible. It. It's not okay, possible so, to skip that. I don't know. I don't remember seeing it. Maybe I was so caught up in the moment that it didn't register, but I just watched it before we shot this and it was so emotional that I feel like I would have remembered that if I had seen it. So maybe it bugged and it just didn't play for me or maybe I ran too No, because it plays directly into whether you're, you choose to go up the hill with John or back to the Well, no, thing. I understand. But what I'm saying is I feel like I just started 
running and then I got the conversation with John. I don't know how it happened, obviously. I don't Maybe know. Maybe you the just don't remember it. it happening. But I but I watched it again for the well, what I thought was for the first time right now and I was like, "Oh my god, that f-, and the way he whis- he whispers thank you He's and like, your horse thank is you here. and like you're like Brr. Because I remember seeing my horse shot, but then I remember thinking after I finished the game like that that was kind of weird. Like they didn't give you a moment with your horse. So I don't think I saw it. I don't know how I would have skipped it, but I feel like something happened and I didn't see it. Because hmm. I remember feeling like that door was that chapter, that cl- door, whatever, was never closed with my horse. Hmm. I, I was like, oh, that my horse was shot and that they're not going to touch on this again. Like that's weird. But anyway, very, very emotional, especially for you, Simer, who hunted for your horse. Dude, hunted, but- the horse took me forever to get. And so when she fucking died, I was like, no and yeah th- that part was super super sad because i had been that horse that i had at the very end i had been with for like the last like 25 hours of the game yeah because um, i just i i knew that i could have gone to buy maybe a horse that had like another meter up in the categories but i was like no i like this horse i named him bandito because he had a mask on his face Aww. and i was just like this is this is my this is my guy we're at maximum bonding even though i never successfully drifted on my horse <laughs> um <laughs> it was that was that was a really sad moment um i know we're getting to the end here because it's been quite a long show um i yes. do want to mention some things that you guys may not have realized that you can find out at the end of the game um, so John can find out what happened to the rest of the game via in-game encounters. Um, so this is this write-up is from SVG.com. It says, it's easy to miss these characters if you don't visit their specific locations. Simon Pearson can be found running the general store in Rhodes. Tilly Jackson can be found in Saint-Denis, married to a wealthy man and visibly pregnant. Mary Beth Gaskell can, became a successful novelist and can be found at the Valentine train station. Reverend Orville Swanson, who sobered himself up from both alcohol and drug addiction, quietly left the game during Chapter 6, as mentioned in a newspaper article detailing his rise to the ranks as a highly successful minister in New York. And unfortunately, the whereabouts of Karen Jones, who heavily descended into alcoholism near the end, are unknown. There are also nine graves to be found for the deceased members of the Vandalin gang. Arthur's grave, of course, which is featured in the credits where Mary comes to visit, can be found near the mountain where he died. Jenny Kirk's grave can be found at Spider Gorge. Davy Callender, who died during the intro, is buried at Poulter. Sean's grave can be found near the old camp location outside of Rhodes. Kieran Duffy's grave is outside of Shady Bell. The graves of Hosea Matthews and Lenny Summers are north of saint And Susan Sh- Grimshaw's grave can be found close to the remains of the final Vanderlyn camp near, Be- near Beaver Hollow. And while not part of the gang, Eagle Fly's grave can be found at Donner Falls. I found Arthur's and Susan's, and it was very sad. Was I did very- not go to them. Oh. But there yeah. are two minor things. This is so small, but I just am like, I noticed these and I wanted to mention them. Um, first off, did you notice, Brittany, that the shirt that Abigail gives you is the shirt you wear when you die? No. It looks very similar. I assume that's what they were going for. Oh, shit. Um, so, mean- like, there's a part of the epilogue where sh- she tells you to go get a package in town and whatever. He gets mad because he ends up using his real name and someone finds out or whatever. Uh, but, and then she's like, it wasn't even a dress for me. It was a gift for you. And then the gift is this shirt and it, uh, it, and then I I'm looking at the photo and it looks really similar. Yeah. I'm oh, like, I'm pretty sure so that's the shirt that you wear when you die. And then also what I, I, cause I rewatched the red dead ending of, of John dying. And I was like, the breathing that they do is so similar. Oh, yeah. Like the way John breathes as he's dying is similar to the way Arthur breathes when he's dying. And I was just like, ah! like these fucking people. I hate you, but I love you. But I hate the only you. person I could talk to after I finished it was John, John Drake. And I was texting him and I was like, oh, my God, why? And he was very good at counseling me. And it was good therapy because, <laughs> oh, my God. It was so hard. I'm walking around the house crying and Jason's on some stupid conference call and I can't go to him because I can't spoil it, but I eventually did have to spoil it for him. I'm like, I need someone to talk to. I'm sorry. But shout out to John Drake. Thank you, sir. Yes. You were there for me when I needed you. (laughs) Shout out to John Drake indeed. Well, um, uh, as much as like you guys might think that I didn't like this game, obviously, if you listened to last week's episode, you know, it was my number six game of 2018. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed many, many, many parts 
of this game and was so glad that you guys pushed me to finish it to the end and to see it all the way through. Because I think it's one of those pieces of game making that everybody should experience. I don't believe that you should play it all the way through to the end if you're not having fun with it. There are YouTube videos for that, thankfully. Um, but it's one of those rare pieces of art that is hard to describe in certain aspects and is really innovative in a lot of aspects. And I'm glad that I did it. I'm glad that I played. I didn't appreciate it the way that you did, Brittany or Steimer. And, you know, like, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I didn't play very much of Red Dead Redemption. But I still appreciated it for what it was, not having, you know, had that narrative background. Yeah, it's an incredible game. And it's hard to believe it's here. It's been out. We just did a spoiler cast on it after waiting for, what, eight years for this thing? Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. And now and maybe now we'll someday Red Dead Online <laughs> will get its act together. <laughs> we can go back to it. <laughs> wah, wah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for hanging in there with us, everybody. We know it's been a long one, and we hope that you enjoyed the discussion. If there's a favorite moment you had from the game, you know, let us know. We're going to be op uh, uploading this spoiler cast as its own video, so please refrain from making any comments about the spoiler cast section of the episode uh, publicly because you know we want to keep this for private from people who don't want to be spoiled that's why we gave the warning at the very beginning of this segment um but we hope you enjoyed it and uh we will be back next week with more games to talk about uh, there's actually a new game coming out in a couple of months that i got to play today that i can talk about next week it's going to be very exciting mm -hmm. um until then have a fantastic weekend and we'll see you next time bye everybody